Witnesses include policyholders and insurance company executives. Domestic Policy Subcommittee Chairman Dennis Kucinich chaired this two-hour and 50-minute hearing. Good morning. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee will now come to order. Today's hearing will examine how the bureaucracy of the private health insurance industry influences the relationship between physicians and their patients. This hearing is divided into two parts. Today, the subcommittee will hear testimony from patients and health care providers with personal experiences. The subcommittee will also hear from a former health insurance executive who will testify about internal practices of the industry and two individuals whose focus is on health policy. Tomorrow, the subcommittee will hear testimony from top executives of the six largest health insurance companies in the United States. Now, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. An observer of the public debate on reform of the health insurance industry would draw three conclusions, all of which are false. The first is that government does not play a role in insuring health care today in America. The truth is that tens of millions of Americans get their health insurance right now through government-run health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, VA, and TRICARE. The second myth is that government-run health care is inefficient and wasteful compared to private insurance. The truth is that government-run health care has lower prices and much lower administrative costs than private insurance. Government-run insurance negotiates harder bargains with pharmaceutical companies to get lower prices. It has no multi-million dollar executives, no corporate jets, no dividends to pay, no lobbying expenses, no campaign contributions, no front groups to pay for and no television advertising. Private insurers pay for all of these expensive things out of the premium dollars they collect, and these things have nothing to do to improve health care outcomes. The third myth is that bureaucracy is solely a governmental problem. The truth is that for millions of Americans, there are layers of corporate bureaucrats standing be between them and their doctors, often on matters of life and death. And those bureaucrats work for the private health insurance industry. The hearing we'll hold today and tomorrow will examine the nature, costs, techniques, and consequences of the bureaucracy of the private health insurance industry. Wall Street considers paying for your cancer treatment a loss. And they want to see health insurers keep those losses to a minimum. They have a statistic known as the Medical Loss Ratio, or MLR, that keeps track of how effectively private health insurance bureaucrats achieve that financial objective of keeping losses at a minimum. To please Wall Street, private health insurers have to deny medical claims, raise premiums, or both. Even as the rate of inflation of medical prices has increased, the share of premium dollars spent on medical care has come down to around 83 percent, from over 90 percent in the early 1990s. The state regulatory record and civil litigation dockets are replete with recent findings of wrongful denial and delay of health care by private insurance bureaucrats. For instance, in 2008, Pacific Care, a subsidiary of United Healthcare, paid a $3.5 million fine, $25 million in waived premiums, 
and reimbursement of medical expenses and restoration of health care to nearly 1,000 patients to resolve violations of California law, including wrongful denial of 130,000 claims, incorrect payment of claims, failure to acknowledge receipt of claims in a timely manner, and for imposing the hassle of multiple requests for documentation already provided. Similar regulatory actions exist for nearly every private insurer. Private health insurance bureaucrats play with the lives of people, our constituents, and when they are at their most vulnerable, when they have a life-threatening injury, when their children develop severe diseases, when their parents are battling cancer, this is when the pressure that insurance companies can bring is the greatest. From an insurer's perspective, people who really need their health insurance to cover life-saving medical treatment threaten the company with medical losses, and investors want medical losses to be minimized in order to maximize profits, pure and simple. The fact is that in America today, you don't know if your health insurance will take care of your serious medical bills until you become seriously ill or injured. By then, it is too late to shop around. You buy health insurance on blind faith that coverage will be afforded to you when you really need it. But you receive no guarantee from private health insurance, especially if you get very sick. And that contradicts the purpose of health insurance in the first place, to spread the cost of illness, especially serious illness requiring expensive care. We will hear today how the private health insurance bureaucrats have become more sophisticated at denying expensive treatment and more effective at wearing down doctors and patients, conditioning them to choose to pay for the treatment themselves or to go without, rather than insist that their insurer pay. In the business of private health insurance, corporate bureaucrats may put profits before people, thereby becoming as noxious as disease itself. Such was the conclusion of the Ohio Supreme Court when it upheld the largest jury award in Ohio's history against Anthem for denying life-saving treatment to Esther Dardinger from the court decision. Quote, then came the bureaucracy. Anthem had worn talking about the Dardingers, Anth Anthem had worn the Dardingers down as surely as the cancer had. Like the cancer, Anthem relentlessly followed its own course, uncaring, oblivious to what it destroyed, seeking only to have its way. End of quote from the Ohio Supreme Court in a case involving Anthem. At this time, I'll recognize the ranking member from Ohio, the Honorable uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. You may Ch proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you uh, having this hearing. Um, I want to thank our witnesses for participating, and I look forward to hearing um, their perspectives, unique perspectives, um, on this important topic. I know many of them have tragic stories to share with us, and, and we certainly, uh, they certainly, you certainly have um, our sympathy. The ongoing health care debate is extraordinary. Americans who were not previously engaged in politics are now attending town halls, rallies, tea parties. During August and September, I had the opportunity to meet with many of our constituents in Ohio. Each and every person I talked to expressed grave concern about a government run health care system. But no one denied that our current system needs reform, and that's what I hope we can gather from the next two days, the kind of reforms that are actually going to make sense and help families, help small business owners, help Americans. Healthcare spending is out of control, and we are not covering many of the most vulnerable. Medicare alone accounts for 3.5 percent of the gross domestic product. The Congressional Budget Office projects that by 2080, without intervention, it will be as high as 13.5 percent. Uh, excuse me, total health care spending in 2007 exceeded $2.2 trillion, which represents over 16 percent of GDP. In the debate, there are areas of agreement between Republicans and the President. In fact, last week during the speech to the Joint Session of Congress, the President said 
and I quote, let me set the record straight. My guiding principle is and always has been that consumers do better when there is choice and competition. That's how the market works. Mr. Chairman, on this point, I agree with the President. In fact, we have co-sponsored a piece of legislation, H.R. 3400, that I believe relies on free market approaches and tax credits to incentivize Americans to buy their own plans instead of mandates and surtaxes, which are part of the current House bill that passed out of committee. Our bill allows individuals and businesses to purchase insurance across state lines, increasing their insurance choices from perhaps a dozen carri uh, carriers to over 1,300. In contrast, the bill being discussed decreases competition by installing a government-subsidized government public option into the marketplace to crowd out the private sector. Real competition in the private market helps reduce prices. A government-run monopoly will cost all of us, especially our children and grandchildren. Rather than a federal government serving as an intermediary, my colleagues and I realize that individuals and families are best served when there is a strong relationship between them as a patient their primary and, specialty, and their primary and specialty health care providers. Our plan strengthens, strengthens that relationship by reducing the practice of defensive medicine brought about by lawsuits. Enacting a medical liability reform will help reduce the price of medical malpractice insurance and defensive medicine, both of which are passed on to consumers through increased cost and higher insurance premiums. By establishing health courts, capping non-economic and creating best practice measures, we will eliminate frivolous lawsuits that harm physicians while also ensuring that justice is done to true victims. Mr. Chairman, I hope the common sense solutions, that common sense solutions are not ignored. I believe Americans trust their health care professionals more than they trust politicians and federal government bureaucrats. They want to keep what they like best about their current plan while addressing some of the problems with cost, access, and portability. My trust rests in the ingenuity and compassion of the American people and the professionalism and competence of our health care professionals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. I want to thank the uh, chairman for convening this hearing. Uh, and it is a very important hearing. Uh, one of the things that I want us to keep in mind is that insurance companies are making life and death decisions every single day. Folks talk about government, worrying about government coming in and making decisions. Insurance companies are making life and death decisions every day. There's a gentleman in my neighborhood who had a, a swelling on his leg. And I guess maybe about two years ago, I see him almost every day. I live in Baltimore, 40 miles away from here. And he went in and he found out that it was cancerous. He had uh, surgery, then he had, a, um, then he had radiation. And then he had chemo. And then the cancer apparently spread to other parts of his body. And he had been a hardworking American, working for a, the city of Baltimore. And he had moved into a disability status. And he used to tell me about his problems in that the copay for the chemo left him in a position where he had to choose between eating and paying the copay. And I would see him almost every day. And I just think our society is better than that. This is a point in time where we must put leave politics at the door and address the problems of all Americans. We need to keep in mind, as the President said the other night, over the last two years, one out of every three Americans have had a gap in their insurance coverage. And what does that say? What that says is if you've got a gap in your insurance coverage, that means you've got to get some more insurance at some point. Well, this is a bulletin coming over the wire. The older we get, the more likely it is that we're going to have a pre-existing condition. And if you haven't gotten there yet, you just keep on living. And the fact is that we've got to deal with these pre-existing conditions. We've got to deal with this rescission where a person gets sick. They've been doing everything they're supposed to do, working hard, paying their premiums. And when it comes time for the insurance company, to help them, then suddenly they find they have no insurance. 
we've got to deal with the, the high cost of insurance going up. The President has said it and we have said it. We want you people to keep what they have. But guess what? If it is too expensive, you won't be able to afford it anyway. That's a major problem. And so I am glad that, and I, I had a town hall meeting and it went well. And I have listened to, seen what has happened over, over across the country. It's with regard to town hall meetings. But I think we need to hear not only from the people who are opposed, we need to hear from everyday American citizens and who, who have been placed in a position where they cannot get the coverage they need. And so, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for these two uh, hearings, and uh, I look forward to the testimony. I thank the gentleman. The uh, chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank all the witnesses for being here today. Uh, you know, this idea of, of competition is great, and, and it's uh, interesting to hear people say they want the corporations to be able to go across states. But I think many of them see that just as an opportunity to avoid state regulation. And we have to make sure that if that happens and companies are allowed to go across state, that they do not get to avoid a state regulation, just go to the lowest common denominator on this. They're seeking to avoid competition with any plan that essentially will do things other than their way. And that's one of the reasons that they're so avidly fighting uh, this public option. They're happy to compete with any other plan or any other insurance company that does the things that they do pay really excessive and exorbitant salaries to executives, uh, pay a lot of money for underwriting to figure out ways not to cover people with health care, uh, and give dividends that are just not uh, reasonable, but that are extremely excessive to shareholders who actually punish them uh, when they spend too much of the premium dollar on health care delivery. Uh, it's a little shocking to me as we watch what goes on around the country with all these town meetings that so many people who consider themselves out there fighting for the people are wittingly or unwittingly, apparently, out there shilling for insurance corporations and prescription drug companies. What they're looking for is the status quo. Uh, and that's just a little bit amazing. If they were really populist, they would be out there saying, you know, there is a point in time when government ought to step between corporations that go to the excess, between corporations that use their power and their bureaucracy to deprive us of what we pay our premiums for, and you step in with a little regulation. And we're making sure that competition really does work. But that doesn't seem to be the message that, uh, that is going around out there at all, and it's sort of uh, surprising. When you look at this medical loss ratio that the chairman uh, mentioned earlier, uh, essentially, I, I think, Mr. Potter, you've discussed this on interviews as well, uh, companies get punished when they show their medical loss ratio too high. In the 1990s, it was common for medical loss ratio to be 95 percent. Out of every $100 spent, $95 would go to health care, and $5 would go towards salaries and overhead and profits. And the companies were doing well. They were doing extremely well. Well, studies now show that in some instances that medical loss ratio is 57 percent. 57 percent of your premium dollar going for care and the rest of it going to them. I'd be on the streets pounding away saying, why isn't my government out there doing something to stop that? That's what's ridiculous. You want to go out and yell and scream and take the town hall meetings, go where the culprit is. They're the ones that are taking our premium dollars and what do they give us in return? Recision, you're in the middle of your care and they go by and scrub your records and find out oh, there's a reason we don't have to pay the claim. Uh, making sure that you have a pre-existing condition where you don't get coverage at all or putting a cap on it. A cap on it. 60% of the bankruptcies in this country are directly or indirectly related to medical expenses families are experiencing and 85% of those families had health insurance. That's what we should be on the streets protesting about. And that's why this bill should directly look in there and say, look, we need to put in some regulation. No more rescissions, no more unreasonable caps, no more incredibly high deductibles or co-pays, no more telling people pre-existing conditions are going to keep them off, and no more getting away with spending less than a reasonable amount of our premium dollars on actual health care services. You know, you can have a decent profit, you can have a decent salary, but $80,000 a day, as some executives were getting, and millions of dollars plus bonuses plus stock options, it's not a good way to spend our premium dollar, and that's why this health care reform package ought to be as much about health insurance reform as anything else. And we have to move in that direction. And yes, there should be an option out there where people say, I don't want to go to that private company that gives us that kind of bad coverage. I'll take another option, a public option. And maybe it drives these people to do the right thing. Maybe when they see that there's somebody not playing their game, that we're not just going to let people into the game who do it the way they do it, that they'll have to behave a little better. 
And that's what this is about, and hopefully that's what the American people are going to understand it's about, and we'll move in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're now going to hear testimony from the witnesses. And the first two witnesses are sharing a personal narrative with us, which I think that when we um, in Congress tend to expound on these weighty matters, uh, we're always much uh, more informed when we hear what people have to say about their own experience. And so two of our witnesses will provide us with information about their personal experience. This is important that we, um, that we pay careful attention. Now, there are no additional opening statements, so we will receive testimony from our witnesses. I would like to introduce our first panel. Mr. Mark Gender Nalik, is that right? Gender Nalik. Gender Nalik? Gender Nalik, hard G. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gender Nalik, is that right? I want to make Gender Nalik. Gender, Gender, okay. Gender Nalik, Mr. Gender Nalik is a teacher from Los Angeles, California, where he lives with his wife and three children. His daughter, Sydney, suffers from a rare neurological disorder known as infantile spasms. Ms. Erin Ackley is a resident of Montana where she lives with her husband and their daughter. In 2006, M Ms. Ackley assisted her father, William Ackley, in his struggle to obtain approval from his private health insurer for prescribed medical treatment. Dr. Melvin Stern, MD, has been in solo practice as a primary care pediatrician in Highland, Maryland for the last 28 years. In addition to direct patient care, Dr. Stern has been continuously involved in teaching of medical students, pediatric residents, and physician extenders, such as physician assistants. Dr. Stern has served on the medical factor, uh, uh, faculty of the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and has also previously served as the chairman of the Maryland State Medical Society's Legislative Committee. Dr. Linda Pino, MD is a physician and medical ethicist who consults and educates on issues related to health system operations, managed care, and ethics. Dr. Pino has worked in executive positions in a variety of healthcare organizations and as a physician reviewing hospital requests for admission at the insurance company Humana. Dr. Pino is now a nationally recognized expert on various issues related to health system operations and ethics particularly managed care and, insur and uh, insurance practices. And finally, uh, Mr. Wendell Potter. Mr. Potter has served since May 2009 as the Center for Media and Democracy Senior Fellow on Health Care. Previously, Mr. Potter spent 20 years in a variety of communications positions for private health insurance companies. Mr. Potter was the chief corporate spokesman for Cigna Insurance Company. I want to thank uh, each and every one of the witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee today. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that at this time, if you could rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Uh, let the record reflect that each of the witnesses is answered in the affirmative. I now uh, want to ask each of the witnesses to give a brief summary of uh, your testimony. I want you to keep in mind uh, that uh, it's helpful to have this summary no more than five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. So if you're worried about not getting in a certain word, just know it's going to be in the record of the hearing and all members will have access to that. Uh, we're going to start with Mr. Gender, Genderalnik. 
you're going to be our first witness, and we'd like you to proceed at this time. And I, uh, before you begin, I would uh, like to recognize and welcome the distinguished gentlelady from California, uh, Congressman Watson. Thank you for being here. Y you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I want to thank you for inviting me here today to share my daughter's story with you. I hope it will inform you about the, the human side of the business of health care in America. As an American, it is an honor to be a part of this democratic process at such an important time. And like many Americans, I'm unashamedly guilty of the swagger that comes with that heartfelt feeling that I live in the best country on earth. Unfortunately, that swagger wears a little thin when we don't deliver, when we come up short. And health care is one such area where we are not the best in the world. Most will agree we are paying far too much for health care and getting far less than we're entitled to, far less than the American people deserve, far less than my daughter Sydney deserves. And that less has consequences, real consequences for people, especially my infant daughter Sydney. Early one afternoon, when Sydney was just three months old, as I walked down the steps of the living room of my home, Sydney's arm suddenly struck out at an awkward angle. Her head cocked over to the side. Her eyes looked odd and distant. She was three months old. I was concerned, but not alarmed at that point. I thought, well, that's odd. And then we had a few more and a few more, and we went and saw the pediatrician. And we started what was going to be the beginning of what may be Sydney's lifelong struggle. We're here today to not only help my little girl, but the families who have to fight beyond exhaustion just to receive the care that their hard-earned dollars were supposed to have provided them when they bought their insurance. Soon Sydney was sent to a pediatrician, or from the pediatrician to a neurologist. That neurologist ordered an MRI with contrast dye and an EEG. He conducted his own EEG in office, sent out for the MRI to be done at UCLA Medical Center. The insurance company's medical group denied the medical center he wished to send her to, which was UCLA Children's Hospital. She was then sent to an imaging center, which is pretty much a storefront operation that just does x-rays, MRIs, images. Their staff were incapable of injecting my small daughter with the dye necessary to create the contrast to give my neurologist the images he needed. The end result was my neurologist didn't get the images he needed to accurately diagnose my daughter, but the medical group got to save a little money. The neurologist struggled through. We made the best we could out of it. We reached a point where he was coming to the point where he understood her diagnosis of the infantile spasms. It's a syndrome. It's diagnosed by an index of symptoms. We sent out for a second opinion just to be prudent. We ordered a, second, uh, ordered a second opinion. The insurance company authorized Children's Hospital LA to conduct the second opinion, then refused to authorize the neurologist there to do any of the diagnostics to form an informed second opinion. Uh, my wife took the day off work. She went to the neurologist at Children's Hospital LA, waited, was seen. That neurologist went to order the standard panel of diagnostics, was denied. We were then sent to UCLA where they didn't even have a room for us. We were sent there on a loss leader by the insurance company's telephone agent to say, hey, go there, they're ready for you. Your authorization has been faxed. They weren't ready for us. My wife and my daughter spent the day without food, other than the hospital snacks, in the emergency room. When I finally got off work, they were able to tell us, I joined them at the hospital, they were able to tell us that they weren't able to service my daughter that day. They had no beds, they didn't know we were coming. When they finally were able to admit us two days later, they immediately did their panel of diagnostics that diagnostics confirmed, those diagnostics confirmed the diagnosis of infantile spasms. They set out with the first course of treatment, the universally recommended course of treatment, a drug called ACTH. The medical group would not return a phone call to the whole pediatric neurology department at UCLA, a prestigious medical center. They would give them answers like, we'll call back today by five. It's under review. After six days of being inpatient at UCLA, my wife or I living with my daughter in the hospital room, the doctors came in and said, we're going to have to discharge you. We can't get any response from your insurance company, from your medical group. After crying, I got angry. I tried calling the insurance companies myself. I was hung up on. 
twice for only asking for a supervisor in a tone of voice like I'm speaking to you today. Finally, I called a state regulatory agency. They looked into it on my behalf, and we were able to mysteriously get an authorization number telephone to UCLA and to my wife. No explanation, no written documentation, no anything. Clearly, their plan was to exhaust us, to wear us out. My time is coming to an end here. I have to just conclude with a final statement, if you'll indulge me. Sydney's mom and I have spent so much time fighting to ensure her proper care that all too often I feel like her medical manager instead of her daddy. I need you people to let me be a daddy. I understand there's a lot of talk and a lot of ideas. The Consumers Union is here today with their own ideas on ways we can put consumers back into this competition scheme I hear about, because we're disenfranchised right now. All I want to do is go home and be a dad. Thank you. Chair recognizes Ms. Ackley. Thank you, Mr. Genderoni. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing on health reform. I am honored to have the opportunity to convey my family's struggle with the administrative measures and protocols used by my father's private health insurer and the lengths we went through to obtain his doctor-prescribed treatment in the form of a bone marrow transplant. What follows is an abbreviated version of our emotional journey as my dad fought for his life when his insurance company set up one bureaucratic roadblock after another. My father, Bill Ackley, dedicated 31 years of his life to the children of Montana as a public school teacher and administrator. In 2003, he retired to Florida, trusting his group health insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield of Montana, would continue to pay as they had for 16 years for the medically necessary treatment of his chronic lymphocytic leukemia. In 2005, my dad's doctor determined that he needed a bone marrow transplant because his chemotherapy regimen was no longer effectively managing his cancer. My father was accepted into a transplant program and on December 1st of 2005, an unrelated donor match was found. In January of 2006, my dad began two rounds of intensive chemo to suppress the disease in preparation for his transplant. Four and a half months after finding a donor, we were euphoric on April 14th when my dad's transplant doctor gave him the news that his disease had responded well to the treatments and he was ready to proceed with a mini transplant. However, we marked this as day one of our unexpected and emotional struggle with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Montana. Because his insurance had paid for all of the treatments leading up to the transplant, including the donor search and testing, you can imagine how shocked and heartbroken we were a week later when his insurance notified the hospital, not my parents, that it was denying the mini transplant, claiming the procedure as investigational. For the next 60 days, we continued to run around in circles with the insurance company, never actually speaking to a human who could discuss my dad's case to obtain approval for my father's prescribed treatment while his body was still receptive to a transplant. On the surface, this might not seem like a long time, but when a loved one is going through a life or death struggle, you can hear the clock ticking every minute. My dad's doctor submitted a different request for a full transplant, which had been performed for nearly 20 years, but that too was denied on grounds that it was investigational. It is important to note that both transplant protocols were approved treatments under Medicare. Neither of the two time-consuming appeals processes my dad went through in an effort to overturn the denials were completed in the promised time frame. And during this agonizing time, we reached out to the Montana Insurance Commissioner's Office, who persisted in keeping the insurance company in compliance. We enlisted the help of countless friends and family to hold the insurance company accountable on my father's behalf. 
and we even consulted an attorney who had experience litigating transplant denial cases. On day 48, my dad was readmitted for another round of intensive chemo as his cancer was growing rapidly again because we were waiting for transplant approval. We were emotionally exhausted, frustrated, and devastated that we had to continue focusing our time and energy on holding this insurance company accountable instead of spending quality time with my father and concentrating our efforts on his care. Due to his persistence and refusal to accept that unreasonable insurance company denials would be the deciding factor in his life and death struggle with a disease he had lived with for 20 years, my dad was finally transplanted with the stem cells of a selfless anonymous donor on August 17th, 126 days after the first transplant request. What would have happened if the first transplant request had been approved? We will never know. We do know that he never returned home. We spent Christmas with him in his hospital room and he did make it to the new year. My dad passed away on January 3rd, 2007 at the age of 59, leaving behind a grieving widow and daughter and missing the chance to share his joy of life with his only grandchild, Eliza, born 17 months later. My written testimony includes a very detailed timeline of our struggle with my father's insurance company, and I sincerely hope that you will read it and consider the implications of how an agonizing and bureaucratic denial and appeal process changed the course of my father's treatment and affected his chance for a successful life-saving transplant. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair recognizes Dr. Stern. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich, members of the committee uh, for this opportunity to appear before you today. I'm here on behalf of the patients and families that I take care of, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Maryland chapter, and the National Physician Alliance. Uh, as it's already been noted, uh, I've been in practice in primary care pediatrics for approximately 30 years in, uh, in Maryland um, and have spent a fair amount of that time advocating for my, my patients and my families uh, in the public policy arena. And one of the th templates that I utilize for reviewing public policy is if it makes sense for children, it makes sense for the community. If it doesn't make sense for children, we better go back and re-examine it. And based on that, go forward with the remainder of my evaluation here. Uh, we've discussed the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy of both the private uh, insurer, the for-profit as well as the not-for-profit. Uh, in 2003, Steffi Wallhandler observed that 30 percent of our health care budget, 30 percent of the dollars that we sent in is now spent on administration, and that's in the private sector. Um, as an example of what goes on and how that impacts and has resulted in what happens in the private office. When I started private practice over 30 years ago, there were two full-time equivalents that were supporting me. One was a nurse who was fully involved in patient care, uh, did nothing in terms of administration, and the other was a secretary receptionist who basically handled the scheduling and uh, the billing. Today, I'm still a solo practitioner. I have four full-time equivalents in the office. I am the only one who is exclusively involved in patient care. The other individuals are involved in chasing after insurance companies, uh, doing things like uh, referrals, uh, prior authorizations, and arguing for benefits for my, fam my, my families. Uh, certainly a dramatic increase in, in bureaucratic over in meddling, as it were, in the office procedures. For the bureaucracy that we see in the private sector, the impact, as you've already heard, and I'll, I'll give you a scenario in, in my office of a newborn with a tumor. Uh, this baby was born with a tumor at a world-class hospital in Baltimore. Uh, 
and was insured by a for-profit insurer. From the time the baby was born, this insurer required referrals. Now recognize I had never seen this baby. I was not medically in charge of this baby. For me to begin to refer this baby for additional services at an institution that had world authorities in regards to what should be done and how this tumor should be handled was just sheer nonsense and an obstruction for the care. Uh, it obstructed it to the point where there were therapies and evaluations that were, were missed, were not obtained on a timely manner. Um, but in the end, those therapies went forward initially. The administrative burden was very real. The institution itself had people working in conjunction with my office to get the referrals, uh, to do the paperwork, not to do the medical care, but to do the paperwork to get this child the care that they, she needed. Following the inpatient uh, treatment which required surgery, the child underwent, began outpatient chemotherapy. It was at that point that the insurance company became obstructionist. Uh, and utilizing uh, the Milliman and Robertson criteria for evaluation of whether this service should be paid for, it's denied inpatient chemotherapy services for this infant. Now, you need to understand there are no Milliman and Robertson criteria for infants with tumors, but they refused to recognize that and proceeded to say, no, they were not going to permit this baby to have inpatient services. Uh, the only reason that we were able to move forward with that is that I bluntly told them, look, either provide this infant with what are clearly standard treatments uh, in the hospital or we will have to go public. This is a beautiful baby. It will attract a great deal of attention. You can either deal with this in the media or deal with this appropriately. Uh, and they chose at that point to say, okay, we'll get things organized. Uh, that's not the way we need to run the healthcare system. That's not the way I need to be spending my time. Uh, this invasion and obstruction is not very productive. And finally, I'd like to leave you with a notion of, of the issue of two things. One, this is not really an issue of insurance coverage. Please understand, this is an issue of access to quality health care. And Mr. Cummings is painfully aware of a youngster in our community, Diamante Driver, who had coverage but did not have care and died in this very city as a result of lack of care because providers weren't available. Uh, the last thing is, the current, at the current rate, we know the liabilities that we're generating in the health care area are being left at the feet of our children. Let us make sure as we move forward that the assets are in their hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. I, I uh, want to uh, acknowledge uh, what you said about uh, in mentioning DeMonte Driver. Uh, Mr. Cummings and I have had an ongoing conversation about uh, uh, that young man's death. And I think that uh, before the end of the day, we'll have a chance to recount what happened with him in the system. Uh, Dr. Pino, you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and staff, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I am a former company doctor who made those kinds of life and dis death decisions Mr. Cummings referred to. In fact, one of my prior appearances here was in 1996 to talk about how company doctors uh, cause harm and death to patients. And the fact that little has happened um, is evidenced by the fact that that clip of that hearing has resurfaced and has, is very timely still. Uh, after 1996, I continued to work on health care issues and I've worked in more than 150 legal cases on behalf of patients and assisted patients in appeals. So I have uh, um, a wealth of acquired information about the inner workings of the health insurance company. Oh, the one thing that I think in summary uh, my experience, which I've detailed in my written comments, is that this has never been a more deadly time for patients in terms of insurance practices. They've become more sophisticated and more uh, expert in achieving the cost-cutting and saving um, goals. The 
four areas that I, I would like to talk about specifically, at least to address and make you aware of. The first has to do with claims, and I see a lot of insurance um, rhetoric that says that they're kinder and gentler and they uh, deny fewer claims. But a, a recent study in California showed that, that at least in that study, as much as uh, as many as 40 percent were denied. But the more interesting thing is what we don't know, because the evolution of managed care has been to shift the process of limitation, denial, and substitution more prospectively, so that if you can co-opt the treating physician in the office or the bedside, or you can create conditions like we've already heard today where you obstruct and delay and wear people down, then those are things that are never record recorded. Uh, there's no data or statistics we can go to to show the amount of care that has been um, altered uh, through those processes. Uh, the second thing is that the, the shift in, in health care has been to move everything more technical. So the, the goal over the past decade has been to eliminate the independent medical judgment of physicians and uh, the health care um, professionals to uh, normalize through criteria and uh, other um, uh, scientific-based uh, ways and, and to eliminate the, the patient particulars. Um, coinciding with that is the attempt to make other agents the, the uh, denial factors by, uh, one, co-opting physicians and altering their uh, medical ethics to achieve the goals of the company, but more disturbing is making patients themselves the agents of their own denials through economic um, changes. The, Fourth one, I think, has kind of been touched on already by several remarks here, and that is the expert use of terms like medical necessity, investigational, and experimental. I actually testified in the case that you mentioned, Mr. Kucinich, uh, the Dardinger case, which was a very interesting case because the definition of experimental changed as it went through la layers of review in order to constantly shift and justify the denial. And in fact, part of the email communication that came out in that case was that the health plan employees were deliberately delaying because they knew Mrs. Dardinger was going to die soon. So they were uh, avoiding making a decision in order to um, uh, avoid the, the, even dealing with the issue of paying uh, for it in hopes that she would die before they would have to address it. Um, the, the recent attention on medical criteria and ev evidence-based medicine, uh, it sounds wonderful to talk about best practices. We should, we should be focused on that. But there is a layer of rhetoric there that, that uh, uh, hides what goes on underneath. Uh, companies, you know, for example, the, the criteria for the appropriateness of a hysterectomy should be the same, whether it's in, you know, uh, Boston or uh, Los Angeles. It should be the same whether it's Humana or Cigna, and yet these tools are used and wielded. Uh, they're proprietary. A company would never purchase criteria that would cause it to be more generous and to spend more money. So these criteria are used deliberately to justify denials and to uh, limit uh, care. And, uh, and, and these, these tools are being developed using public research and should be transparent and should be publicly uh, available. Um, there are so many things that I could go into that I have seen in all the cases, and as I said, I went into uh, detail in the written uh, remarks, but I think the last two things I'd like to sum up is that patients are not mere anecdotes, and that's the way the insurance company would like to dismiss any claims of adverse uh, effects on patient well-being or, or health. And uh, the last thing is that they operate in a medical, in a, uh, an ethical and legal void. There's no medical ethics when you're uh, at, uh, um, working on behalf of stockholders. And the legal uh, situation is that most Americans have no legal recourse because of uh, ERISA and, and other complications holding these companies accountable. So I personally believe we will have no health reform unless we reform the health insurance industry to a, a system that is ethical and patient-centered. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Potter. You may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman uh, Kucinich, uh, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity. The title of today's hearing serves as an important antidote to some of the rhetoric about who or what stands between a patient and his or her doctor. I know there are many who fear the idea of a government bureaucrat in that space, but the alternative has proved much more fearsome. The status quo for most Americans is that health insurance bureaucrats stand between them and their doctors right now, and maximizing profit is the mandate that has simply overtaken this industry. As members discuss the various compromises that undoubtedly will be floated in the coming weeks, I encourage you to look very closely at the role of for-profit insurance companies in particular and the role that they play in making our health care system both the most expensive and one of the most dysfunctional in the world. I know this hearing and others you are holding will help members of Congress look beyond the misleading and destructive rhetoric making the rounds and the headlines and help provide a real sense of what life would be like for most of us if the kind of so-called reform the insurance are lobbying for, insurers are lobbying for is enacted. An estimated 25 million Americans are now underinsured uh, for two principal reasons. This is in addition to the 45 million people who are uninsured. First, the high deductible plans that many of us have been forced to accept require us to pay more out of our own pockets for medical care, whether or not we can afford it. Secondly, the number of underinsured people has increased as far more have fallen victim to deceptive marketing practices and bought what essentially is fake insurance. The industry is insistent on being able to retain the so-called so benefit design flexibility so insurers can continue to market these kinds of often worth, worthless policies. The big insurers have spent millions of dollars acquiring companies that specialize in what they call limited benefit plans. An example of such a plan is marketed by one of the big insurance companies under the name of Starbridge Select. Not only are the benefits extremely limited, but the under, underwriting criteria established by this insurer essentially guarantees big profits. Pre-existing conditions are not covered under the first six months, the employer must have an annual turnover rate of at least 70 percent. So most workers don't even stay on the payroll long enough to use their benefits. And the average age of employees must not be higher than 40, and no more than 65 percent of the workforce can be female. I'm sure you've all heard insurance executives say over the past few months that they are bringing solutions to the table this time to help you address the problems of the uninsured and the underinsured. If they were to be completely honest, however, they would tell you that the solutions they really have in mind are moving millions more of us into high deductible and limited benefit plans. If Congress goes along with these solutions, the bill it sends to the President might as well be called the Insurance Industry Profit Protection and Enhancement Act. That said, the executives you will hear from tomorrow rarely use the term insurance to, insurance to describe their businesses these days. They refer to their companies now as health benefits companies or health solutions companies, and for a very good reason. They have been moving rapidly away from the, the risk of, that insurers used to assume for their customers and toward a business model that enables them to administer benefits for large self-insured companies and also to shift the financial burden of health care to, to individual workers if their employers are not big enough to self-insure. If I were a member of the subcommittee, I would ask the executives tomorrow about this trend. I would ask them what has been happening to their fully insured books of business in recent years. If they are honest, they will tell you that it has been shrinking and that they have been taking deliberate actions to make it shrink. According to a recent story in the Wall Street Journal, the seven largest for-profit health insurance companies have seen a decline of five million members in their fully insured books of business just since 2007. I would ask the executives why this has happened and if they expect this trend to continue. And I would ask them what kinds of businesses are fully insured these days. Again, if they're honest, they will tell you that they are primarily small to mid-sized customers that are not large enough to self-insure. Members of the subcommittee, that does not bode well for the future of this country or our economy, as most of the job growth in the U.S. is occurring in small to mid-sized businesses. I would ask the executives what kind of health benefits Health benefit plans are marketing now to small businesses and to businesses with a high rate of turnover among employees. If they are honest, they will tell you they are marketing limited benefits or high deductible plans to these businesses. 
I would ask Aetna and, and Cigna in particular why they are sponsoring the first annual voluntary benefits and limited medical conference in Los Angeles next month. And I would ask them what voluntary really means. If they are honest, they will tell you that workers enrolled in voluntary benefit plans pay the full premium as well as high out-of-pocket expenses. Their employees do not have to pay a dime. Their employers don't have to pay a dime toward their employees' health care benefits. And many of these plans actually prohibit employers from subsidizing the premiums. As the organizers of the uh, Los Angeles Conference notes on its website, voluntary benefits and limited medical plans are a multi-billion dollar industry and one of the fastest growing segments in the health insurance industry. Another question you might consider asking is how much money insurance companies make from investments uh, by delaying payments to health care providers. As you know, doctors now have staff members dedicated solely to trying to get insurance companies to pay claims that have been denied. The longer an insurance company can avoid paying a claim, the more interest it can earn from the float. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, this is the current state of the inadequately regulated free market system the health care companies want to preserve. We already have 25 million Americans who are underinsured. If the insurance industry gets what it wants out of reform, that number will grow very, very fast in the years ahead. People you know, your constituents, maybe even your sons and daughters and your grandchildren will be joining the ranks of the underinsured and they will be forced by law to pay private insurance companies for their lousy coverage. And you and I and other taxpayer payers will have to subsidize the premiums for those who cannot afford them. I implore you not to let that happen. Thank you for considering my views. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Potter, for your testimony and also your expression of uh, civic consciousness. I, I want to, before, just before I begin my questions, I just want to say um, uh, how deeply moved I was to hear the testimony of, uh, of Mr. Gender Nalik and Ms. Ackley. Um, how is your daughter? She is improving gradually. Uh, her condition is, is hard to treat seizures, has a hard to treat seizure disorder. Uh, we have been through many pharmaceuticals and currently she is on what is known as the ketogenic diet. It is a medical diet uh, designed to alleviate seizures. We are having some success, but she is way off her benchmarks. Uh, if we don't arrest the seizures, her cognitive development will leave her severely mentally retarded. Well, your, your family shall remain with her in our thoughts. I, I just also want to say to Ms. Ackley, I had the chance to uh, read the exhibits, but in particular the obituary of your dad, who, who uh, was obviously a wonderful person. And I can imagine what it's like for you to testify. I have to tell you, you know, when I was listening to both your testimony, I'm sure this is true of other members. I could, it wasn't just hearing the words. I could feel it in my heart. And, and, and this is the kind of uh, testimony I think that can move the, the country. And, you know, I, I just, uh, you can feel this. Thank you for being here and our, our condolences to your family and from uh, your, this experience perhaps Congress will become better informed about the actions that we, we need to take. I want to thank Dr. Stern for uh, sharing with us his testimony as well as Dr. Pino for her uh, understanding of the in inner workings of the industry. Now, I want to um, begin question with um, uh, Mr. Potter, who, as I said earlier, is the former head of corporate communications for Cigna uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia. The First, I want to ask uh, Mr. Potter about the business profit model of the private insurance industry. Uh, what is the business model of the insurance companies? How do they make money? They make money uh, by avoiding as much risk as possible and often by dunking, dumping people who are sick. And they do this through a variety of means. One is delaying or denying care. Another is to rescind policies that uh, um, uh, we have read about in the news and, and has been the subject of some subcommittee uh, hearings in which people who have been paying their premiums for many years, when they get sick and have high medical bills, the insurance company will review their original applications and if they find any reason to uh, cancel it, they will. You, you, and, you talk, uh, 
and also purging small businesses. They, they're, they're, they're doing what? Purging small businesses. They have a, uh, uh, they deliberately uh, look to see if there are uh, small businesses and mid-sized businesses uh, that are customers whose medical claims are higher than they, the underwriters expected. And, and they will jack those rates up, uh, the premium rates, when those books, when those customers' uh, accounts come up for renewal. And uh, they'll, they'll jack them up so high that these businesses have no alternative but to uh, uh, drop their insurance coverage. They can't afford, that's why we've had such a drop in the number of small businesses over the years. Uh, it's declined from 67 percent uh, in the 90s to uh, just about 38 percent now. And then you've talked about the denial or redu reduction of coverage. Uh, would you explain to the subcommittee what is policy rescission and how widespread was that practice while you were in the industry? Yeah, policy rescission happens, um, uh, this is in the individual market, not so much in the uh, uh, market in which people get their coverage from or through their employer. Many people don't have the option of getting their coverage through their employer. And you have to fill out an application if you uh, uh, want to get coverage, of course. Uh, and you have to include on that application whether or not you've been sick in the past, what, what, why you've gone to the doctor, if you've been hospitalized. In other words, what pre-existing conditions do you have? Uh, that we should know about. And if you are, uh, and in, in many cases, a pre-existing condition will mean you can't get coverage at any cost. Uh, and also, uh, children who are born with birth defects ultimately will not be able to get coverage in this system we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a means of being able to, again, call the sick, to avoid paying claims. And if you uh, uh, fail to disclose something and you get uh, uh, sick and there are high medical bills, that are uh, sent for payment to your insurance company, they'll look at your application and they'll look to see if maybe you've uh, in inadvertently uh, or even purposely not disclosed something. Can, can you, you know, I, one of the things that we've been hearing in the past uh, uh, few weeks is how private insurance, in, the private insurance industry uses special interest groups Yes. to craft, market, and send a message that the industry wants to send. Uh, can, could you explain how this happens, and uh, can, you, um, uh, can you comment on how the industry wants us to believe that they're there to help us to get healthier? Uh, what do they think they're doing? And, uh, and, you know, who are they talking to? You know, the industry, and I know this from having worked in the, uh, on a lot of trade association committees over the years uh, and serving on strategic communications committees, uh, they, they plan and, and carry out uh, duplicitous PR campaigns on one level. What kind, what du duplicitous. Uh, one is I call the charm offensive in which they will come here and they will tell you that they're in favor of reform and they'll be working with you as good faith partners and with the president. Uh, and they'll say the same thing they, they said in 1993, 94, that they're in favor of uh, getting rid of the pre-existing condition clauses and in favor of uh, uh, avoiding uh, or, or making uh, or the cherry picking that goes on. And so they'll say one thing and do another. Uh, yeah, exactly. Did, did they do that consistently? Yeah, they do it experience? consistently. They say what they think you want to hear. And that's the charm offensive that they, that they carry out. Uh, and they're, they're, they'll talk about how much they're in favor of bipartisan reform, for example. Behind the scenes, they will be conducting these um, uh, covert PR campaigns. Uh, and they work through big Washington-based PR firms or New York-based PR firms uh, that set up front groups for them. Uh, like in the, the 90s, a, a group called the Health Benefits Coalition was set up. Uh, and it was presumably uh, a business coalition, but the funding came largely from health insurance companies. And the sole purpose was to kill the patient's bill of rights. When you say front groups, you mean these are groups that they then mobilize to try to present uh, themselves as representative of public opinion? That's right. And they, they, they employ a lot of PR tactics. Uh, uh, and they work also with uh, uh, the media and with members of Capitol Hill. But, on, but with the media, they, the, the PR people who uh, have connections with producers and reporters will feed uh, messaging, messages to them, talking points. And, uh, and there are a lot of uh, reporters and producers and pundits who are very sympathetic to, to them. I, I'm uh, uh, looking forward to having a chance to ask Mr. Potter some more questions. But my time has expired. And I want to, uh, uh, be, before I recognize Mr. Jordan, I want to acknowledge the presence of the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur, who's uh, joined us.
Uh, and Mr. Jordan, you may proceed for thank, thank uh, five you, minutes. Ma thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I, I apologize to the committee and to our witnesses. I had to jump out. I'm in another committee going on just next Mr. door. Mr. Jordan, well. we're always in awe of how yeah, you can right. be right. in two committees at one time, but we're glad you're here. Thank you for this important hearing and for, for the witnesses' testimony. And 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 to Mr. Uh, Mr. Ginder Nalik and Ms. Ackley, I mean your your stories. I think every single American would agree what, what you went through is wrong. You, you pay your premiums, you, you're honest when you sign up for your contract, you should, you should not have to go through the harassment and the things, I mean this is coming from a you know, conservative Republican that says what, what happened there is wrong. Americans, it seems this whole health care debate as it's unfolded here the last several months, Americans hate being told what to do. And this idea that somebody's going to get between them and their family and their doctor, whether it's the insurance company or, frankly, whether it's the government, is just something that just doesn't sit well with them. So I, I think there are things we have to focus on that empowers the family and doesn't have what you described, um, you know, take place. Um, I, I liked what, what I think Dr. Stern said earlier. I'm, I'm old enough to remember as well when I was a kid uh, going into the family doc and there was typically one person out front, and in those days it was typically a lady. Um, taking care of things and the reception work and, and, and maybe she was there, that individual was the nurse as well. Today there are more people out front complying with all that bureaucracy, whether it's government or insurance, there are more people out front than there are in the back trying to get you well. And, and that's, that's a problem and that's what's so frustrating to so many, um, so many Americans. Let me just walk through some of the things I outlined in, in my opening statement and just see, and, and I'll, I'll go to Dr. Stern if I could. Do you think we need, uh, do you think we need some liability reform uh, in, in our current health care system? Do you think that's appropriate? The, the short answer is very definitely yes. Do you think there's, uh, there's uh, the, the need for uh, more empowerment, say, uh, health savings accounts, uh, association health plans? I can remember just two weeks ago I was given a speech before I even talked to the group, had a husband and wife walk up to me, small business owners. They're in the business and they have two employees and they said, you know, Congressman, we would love the ability to pull together with other similarly situated, other small business owners and, and use the economies of scale to, do you think that, that makes sense in our health savings accounts, association health plans as part of a way to empower people and help with our cost and help with our system? There is a conflict there. Um, the issue of pulling together and generating much larger insurance pools makes an infinite amount of sense. Uh, and in fact, in, in Maryland, we do have uh, a small business pool. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of the health savings account and the notion that the consumer can be empowered to spend that dollar more wisely uh, just flies in the face of what the actual market is. Medicine is not a free market. I agree with that. No way. A free market demands the free flow of information both ways. Okay, so, and, uh, and I was going to go there. So how do we get that? How do we get that transparency? How do we get to where, I mean, there's a great piece, I, at least I read on the plane flying in this week in the Atlantic about a um, business, businessman who talks about the experience his father went through getting an infection in the hospital and he, he outlines what he thinks needs to happen in health care and he talks about the fact that it's not a free market and it's always somebody else who's paying the bill and, and, and that's the fundamental problem. Uh, so tell me what you think needs to happen so we do get the transparency we need to have the right kind of market out there. The, the transparency has to be within the health care system itself to have the broker. The insurance companies are not in the health care business. They're a broker. I'm in the health care business. I deal directly with the patient. The University of Maryland is in the healthcare business. They deal with the patient. Johns Hopkins is in the healthcare business. They deal with the patient. To have the broker intercede in that interaction is simply not productive. Uh, and you have, and in my, my written testimony, uh, some very specific actions that we've had to take. Uh, one of those is a bill that I worked on in the Maryland General Assembly and moved for, fortunately moved forward on the, on the national scene was the issue of the uh, mandated benefit for maternity care. Mm -hmm. um, th there is no way to inter have the private insurer intercede and make that determination that a child and a, and a mother should be going home at such and such a time. That's a medical decision. Right. Should be left to the medical authorities. I agree. Uh, if there are, are 
mal if there's malfeasance in that, it's the medical profession that should be taking care of it, and we do. Okay. Um, but I, to, to assume that this is a marketplace issue, I think simply isn't going to fix the problem. That's how we've been dealing with it. It's not a free market. And we don't have, the consumer doesn't have the information that they need to make that analysis. Even if they had the information, they don't have the understanding. I mean, I went to medical school. I did additional training well, just mean, to be able to make I don't the know, I don't know that's always the case. I'll use my, I'll use, I'll use our, we have a health savings account in our family, um, high deductible health savings account. Um, I did what I assume many of my colleagues do every couple of years go for the physical that they offer here with uh, the doc on Capitol Hill did the blood work, did everything. He says, you know what, we can, we can have you, we can schedule for a colonoscopy as well. I said, you know, I'll think about it and, and uh, decided I'd rather do it at home. Found out our insurance doesn't cover it, but also know that, you know, I'm 45 and you're 50 is kind of the recommended time you do this. So I could have depleted our account or I can just wait. And we decided to wait. So there was a situation where we made the decision as a family that, or I made the decision that we would, we would just wait. So I, I do think it can work and has a place. Um, but what I'm, I'm interested in getting is, is a more what we need to do so that we empower the patient, the consumer, the family as much as we can and eliminate this, this bureaucracy, whether it's the government, whether it's, it's insurance companies, it gets between uh, the patient and the, and the caregiver. And my time went way too fast, Mr. Chairman, so I'll yield back. I thank my colleague from Ohio uh, before I introduce uh, Mr. Cummings for questions. I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, presence in the audience of some visitors who have come to Capitol Hill to uh, uh, indicate their concern about the reimbursement policies with respect to prosthetics. So uh, I, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, your presence. Uh, uh, see the young man in the front row. You're, we're glad that you're here. Maybe someday you'll be on the other side of this, uh, uh, of this uh, dais here. So thank you so much for being here. And at this time, we'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland for five minutes of questioning. Dr. Prater, um, first of all, thank all of you for your testimony. It's been very uh, eye-opening and very helpful. Dr. Potter, one of the, the things that, that really bothers me is that uh, when you talk about insurance companies, the media, health insurance companies, the media, and you complain about them, the media seems to bend in the direction of saying that you're beating up on them. And that really bothers me because when I listen to your testimony, and I can tell you as a lawyer that things that you've talked about to me are, if not fraudulent, are very, very close and are criminal. In other words, when you say that you are going to, when a person or an insurance company has people paying, say, for 16 years, and when it comes time, they are loyal in paying their payments, but when it comes time for them to get what they are due, and that's a simple uh, concept of contract law. You bargain for something and you get back something. But when they come to get it, what they said, I mean, listening to the testimony here, when you hear, hear Dr. Stern, basically what he said is that he has to fight to get what he needs for his patients, and not everybody's a Dr. Stern. I know there are 99 million great doctors, but he has to fight, and he has to double, has to double the number of employees in the fight. So I'm trying to figure out, uh, do you think it's an unfair statement when, I mean, do you think it's a fair statement when they say you're beating up on the insurance companies? Oh, absolutely not. Um, it's, it's part of the, the PR campaign of the industry to, to protest that they're being demonized. And, uh, and, I, and I, I, as a, someone who was in PR for the industry for 20 years, it's part of what I did when I was there. Uh, they, they, they want you to see them as, uh, again, good faith partners and working with, uh, with Congress and the, with the President and, and not behind the scenes uh, doing all they can through a lot of ways of essentially laundering money through big PR firms and setting up uh, groups that they don't want anyone to know that they have any association with, <clears throat> but which they're funding, uh, to, to try to, to gut reform or to shape it in ways that will benefit them more than Americans. Uh, one thing that's happened uh, over the years, and I saw this from my 
role initially as a, a, a journalist, but then later as a PR guy, our, our, our media has changed a lot. The newsrooms are shrinking. There's very little investigative reporting, and reporters are so stressed for time and uh, uh, that they will often just take a, a statement that I would write uh, and, 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 and go with it and say, well, that, I've got the insurance company's point of view here. Uh, the, 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 the insurance companies and other industries, other special interests have really benefited from the change in the way the media operates and the growth and power of corporate public relations. You know, doc, uh, Dr. Pino, I, um, I'm wondering, you know, when I listen to, to the testimony here and then I watch the, the, some of the town hall meetings where people uh, were uh, loudly protesting and, and, and that's, that's all well and good. But I sat there and I wondered how many people, if they really read the legislation, would understand that this probably would help them. And I get the impression I know there are many reasons that have been given for these protests, but I get the impression that part of it must be what I call it won't happen to me syndrome. In other words, that people assume that, oh, that happened over there in Indiana, that happened over there in Baltimore, that happened, but it won't happen to my family. It won't happen to my friends. I won't have a, a, a similar experience as uh, Ms. Ackley. And so, I mean, so how, I mean, so I take it that this, the things that, that you're talking about are pretty widespread. A absolutely, and, and I think you're, you're right. I mean, people assume that this isn't going to happen to me until, you know, something tragic does. But I can tell you as one of those doctors that sat there and put denied on pieces of paper, that it did not make any difference what somebody's income level was, whether they were Democrat or Republican, rich, poor, uh, you know, black, white, yellow, green, or whatever. The only thing that made a difference was what they were costing and how quickly we could avoid any cost or claim that was going to to uh, hurt profits. I mean, that's, you know, I, I was told when I was first hired that, that I was to use my MD degree to give economic justification to the company's decisions. So, and were you rewarded for that? I mean, I was, in other words, oh, was that part of your evaluation? Significantly rewarded. I mean, I, I quit one company before I got my bonus because we were put on a bonus system, but then when I went to another company, we, you know, my job evaluation depended upon, you know, the number of denials and how much cost savings I generated. And in, you know, the 150 cases that I've worked on as an expert witness, you know, I have read deposition and seen documents, internal documents that will never see the light of day because they're sealed, that show the, the, the reward system and the compensation system for the medical doctors that work for the insurance company. Just one last question. Is there anything that you have seen to make you, over the, since you left the system, I think, when did you leave the system, the last insurance company? Uh, 1990, 91. Have you, is there anything that you've seen in your present work that would indicate that things are better in that regard uh, that you just talked about? Oh, absolutely not. It's, it's far worse. Everything is more evolved, more sophisticated, more technical. The, the methods, the difference between the methods I use to deny care and the methods that are used now is like the difference between surgery with a kitchen knife and a laser gamma knife now. Uh, it's, it, it's just that much more uh, expert. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognize Mr. Tierney. You may proceed. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gendernalik and Ms. Ackley, uh, I, don't, I can't think of any question for either of you that would uh, do a better job than what your testimony did in laying out what some of the issues are. So I do want to thank you uh, for being with us here today. I know how difficult it must be on that. Uh, Mr. Potter, I, I want to go back to you again uh, because I, someone's going to get between the patient uh, and their medical provider one way or the other, the way our system is set up. Uh, not everybody in my district, certainly not even the majority of people in my district, can afford to put money into an account uh, of some sort. And if they do, they're still going to have an insurance uh, company somewhere involved in that. So clearly that's not uh, the answer that we're talking about here. We can regulate. If we try to regulate uh, prohibiting rescission, prohibiting a cap on the, on the insurance and perhaps uh, prohibiting exclusion for pre-existing conditions, but uh, would have to be pretty good at policing to make sure the companies don't just do it anyway or that they don't try to pay fewer claims in some other way. Uh, it would seem to me that one way to do it is to just say that a certain percentage of a premium dollar has to be spent on medical services. So the medical loss ratio 
maybe we go back to where it was in the 1990s and 95 percent. Uh, that would be one way of going at it. Do you agree? I do agree. Okay. And the second one is, is competition with somebody or something that doesn't play by the rules that they play. Right. All right. Right now they're happy with competition. Let's have competition as long as we're all in on this game of trying to make sure our medical loss ratio is low, our salaries are high, our profits are high, and we have these different ways of, of excluding coverage. And I think, uh, would you agree that that's where the public option comes in? That if you don't have something like that, we're rev never really going to get at the crux of this? Absolutely. Uh, th there is some competition, but it's far less now than there was uh, back in the 90s. That's one reason why the medical loss ratio has been able to drop so much. There is such power concentrated in the hands of now seven very large for-profit insurance companies that uh, uh, one out of every three of us is enrolled in some kind of a benefit plan managed by one of those seven big companies. They're, they are accountable to Wall Street. They are not accountable, really, to you and me. And, and uh, we can become victims of their they are striving to meet Wall Street's relentless profit expectations. There is no counter to that right now. Uh, they are all, all playing by the rules that they establish in the marketplace. Uh, there is no government benchmark. They set the rules. They determine what, uh, the, what kinds of policies we will be able to have, what kinds of policies your employer will offer to you. They run the show. They have an enormously tight grip on our health care system far, far more now than did in 93 and 94, and they are richer and stronger, more powerful and uh, more influential than ever before. A public option is absolutely, absolutely vital. Now, I would think that people in the streets ranting and raving would be ranting and raving about that kind of practices that we are talking about engaged in by the insurance companies. If that would really get your blood boiling. You would say, now that would be a populist motion that people would be out in the streets saying, why is our government letting them get away with that? Yeah, why aren't right. they stepping in and protecting us? Yeah. So You're on right. the oversight committee here, we are used to following the money. So we know where the money is going. It is going to Wall Street. It is going to yeah. the people that invest in these companies. What role do you think those companies are playing in inciting people to go in and instead of railing against bad insurance bureaucracy practices, uh, trying to tell how bad their government is. I was speaking at a, a town hall meeting a few days ago, and a woman and I was describing how this works, how how the PR firms work for the in industry and uh, uh, feed pundits talking points. And she came up to me and she said, "No one paid me to come here." And I said. I was thinking, well, no one had to. You don't get the money. It's not, it's not where the money goes. The money goes into the big PR firms who have the influence to manipulate public opinion. That's how it happens. And I did ask her, uh, to uh, Congressman Cummings' point, uh, are you absolutely certain that tomorrow your insurance is going to be there, that your son or daughter is going to be enrolled in a benefit plan that provides protection? And you know, she, she didn't have a good answer to that because there is no guarantee. You do not know if you are going to have your insurance coverage tomorrow. You do not know if you are going to be losing it because you lose your job uh, or if you are going to be forced into a plan that makes you pay so much out of your own pocket that you might as well, you will be forced in some uh, scenarios to buy insurance from private insurance companies, but your benefits may be so limited that you will be sending them money every month for almost nothing, uh, for almost no the reason. Us, which has been, been going on. You know, just tell you one little anecdote from you know an individual that came into my office, you know, like just ranting and raving about the public option, you know, and, and I tried to explain what that would do. He said, "Look, I like my company now." I said, "Fine, then then stay with your company." He said, "Well, except you know, if I get really sick or somebody gets really sick, I don't use the company. I go to the VA <laughs> because if I use the company, they jack up my premiums." Case in point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I right, thank the gentleman. The uh, chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from Ohio. Uh, I Ms. thank Kapper. the chairman very much and uh, compliment him for his steadfast uh, efforts to try to bring health insurance at affordable prices and quality care to all the American people. We are very, very proud to serve with you. Um, I wanted to uh, say to the panel that um, I view my job as defending our citizenry against those who might harm or exploit them or our republic. And these are very important hearings today. As I have listened to your testimony, I keep thinking about pharmaceutical companies being the third most profitable sector in our economy. In the district that I represent, you can't watch, turn the TV on without being besieged by uh, all these ads from the pharmaceutical companies. I don't know if that's true in every district in the country, but they are sure spending a lot of money uh, on uh, advertising. Um, and I keep asking myself, you know, if you have a doctor, what do you need all those ads for on the television? 
uh, it's very curious what's happened. That wasn't true 20 years ago. It's true today, and I can see with the kind of profits they're making uh, where they're putting some of those dollars. Uh, yet I have people from my district, I border Canada, uh, up in northern Ohio, and I can't tell you how many people from my district have to go to Canada because they cannot afford medicine in the United States of America. Yet I see these ads on television and I'm thinking, what doesn't fit here? Uh, how are these dollars being used versus what the need is? Um, the insurance companies are the ninth most profitable industry in this country. And um, Mr. Potter, I think you talked about seven companies now having a third of the market. Yes, that's right. And uh, we heard that yesterday at a hearing by the former head of Cigna Corporation, who I believe will be before this committee uh, this week. <clears throat> um, I remember back to our beloved Uncle Skip from our family. And he used to confide in me. And as he became older and had infirmities, he uh, said, Marcy, um, here's all my insurance. Now, this is a man that was on Medicare. And he emptied out his billfold. And he pulled out all these policies, Art Linkletter policy and this policy and that. I said, Uncle Skip, why, why do you have these policies? You don't need these policies. You have a supplemental and you have uh, your Medicare. He says, well, just in case. And I keep thinking my, to myself, I thought, Uncle Skip, why didn't you tell me about this before? You don't need to spend your money on these. I said, and frankly, with some of the exclusions, this wouldn't give you anything. But he really didn't know. He, was not um, an uh, uninformed person, but he was afraid. He did not have a college degree. And I asked myself, how many Uncle Skips are out there in our country who are buying unnecessary policies uh, that are duplicative? And uh, even with our area offices on aging and so forth, we can't reach every citizen to help them make wise insurance choices. <clears throat> so my questions to you really are, the bill uh, that the President has proposed um, has language that only encourages for the pharmaceutical companies price negotiation for the cost of prescription drugs. Within the VA, uh, within the Department of Defense, we actually negotiate. Uh, it is mandatory. I want to ask your, uh, you to comment on the language that is in the base bill that merely encourages negotiation. Uh, and what that might mean down the road. And number two, on the insurance companies and the fact that seven control so much, um, can you give us a sense of what you see happening in the insurance market in our country? Is it consolidating like we see happening in other segments of our industry, the banking industry, mega banks that just caused this huge implosion in our economy, these very big yes. uh, private companies that seem to be terribly irresponsible. Would you give us a sense of what's happening in the insurance market? Anyone that wants to respond on the pharmaceutical question or on that would be much appreciated. Yeah. I, I think the, the encouraging uh, negotiation, that's not strong enough. Uh, you're exactly right. Another f gentleman I heard was talking about uh, he, he got his care through the VA uh, and he needed medication that cost him um, a modest amount of money, but, if he, but he knew that in in private insurance, he would have to pay about $300 this medication. He was able to pay through the VA uh, a small fraction of that. So it makes a big difference. And in the lives of, of people who are, you know, the, the median household income in this country is just uh, $50,000. The average price of a premium that you get through the workplace for a family is $12,500. If you're shifting more of the financial burden for either drugs or, med uh, or, or, or care at the, for the doctor or whatever, uh, there's not much money left over to pay the rent or buy the groceries. Uh, to, to your point about uh, the seven large companies that, that control the industry, it has, it has, they have become so big through mergers and acquisitions over the, year, not the year, over the years, and I've been a part of a lot of that or, or managing communications around them. There are far fewer companies uh, than there used to be. There's not nearly as much competition as the industry would like you to believe. They say on their website, uh, and, and they'll say in testimony, that there are 1,300 uh, insurance companies that compete. There's nothing like that. If you look closer uh, on their website, you might see, if you can count up, 287. Uh, and, and then that includes vendors to these companies. So they're, it's a fabrication. Uh, there's been so much consolidation in the industry that uh, last year alone, $250 billion flowed through these seven, just these seven companies in revenues. Uh, so you've got uh, enormous concentration of power. It's, it's really uh, uh, a cartel 
of large companies. And they are so big that small companies, and there's been talk about uh, maybe uh, establishing co-ops. There's not a chance that a co-op, uh, a fledgling co-op could, could ever get the resources or have the clout in the marketplace to compete against these big companies. You're talking uh, about the insurance companies. I am. Do you see the same concentration in the pharmaceutical industry? Oh, absolutely. They're, they're, the, the power of the pharmaceutical companies is absolutely, absolutely is great. And they're, they're, they're gigantic companies that are very, very profitable. And, if, uh, if, uh, could I ask, sir, if there are any of the witnesses that have any articles that you could reference that we could incorporate in the hearing record on the nature of that concentration, I personally would appreciate it very much. Certainly. We'll do that. Anyone else want to comment on pharmaceutical profits and uh, insurance company consolidation? Very briefly, my daughter's delay in treatment at UCLA, the first significant delay we received was because the pharmaceutical she required is a drug called ACTH. There was one manufacturer who produced it, QuestCorp. Uh, they've been the subject of Senate hearings due to what they did with their pricing scheme. Uh, in doing my parental due diligence, I went online to look up what this drug was they were going to put in my child, stumbled across investment journals, online investment journals, where the, one of the corporate officers from QuestCorp was speaking freely to investors. So he wasn't speaking, I wasn't the intended office, audience. His remarks were that the drug was an underutilized asset. And because they were the sole manufacturer, they could change their pricing strategy and significantly increase the company's portfolio, which they would then be able to put into, he tried to cast a noble light on other FDA approvals and such. The drug went in July of 2007 from roughly $1,000 a vial to over $23,000 a vial based on published reports. My insurance company doesn't let me see what the actual costs are. So published reports, multiple published reports, had it at that point when my daughter needed it in December of 2007, $23,000 a vial. And just to get to how ludicrous this is, we had to order it from out of state. We had to inject it ourselves. Two untrained people had to inject our daughter nightly with this. We had a syringe explode. We thought how many thousands of dollars just exploded over dad's face. Um, they had a delivery man in a beat-up Nissan who was probably making eight bucks an hour deliver <laughs> four vials of this stuff to my house. And I went, wow, does he know what he has? He'd quit this job and drive across to Mexico and sell this stuff. Uh, clearly, we've had our brush with the pharmaceutical industry. The, I, my solid opinion is that they delayed service to my daughter because of the hit they were going to take. Now, that's the HMO medical group. The pharmaceutical company, on the other hand, knew by orphan drug status they had the leverage. There was no competition in the marketplace for this drug because it serves a minority of people. Very few children are afflicted with my daughter's disorder. Their primary market for that drug are MS patients. And therefore, they leveraged it as the man was candidly speaking in investment journals, up to 23,000. Other published reports after my daughter's required time period on the drug, we were on it for four months. I don't know, you know, estimated cost was 80 to $100,000. The drug went up to over $40,000 a vial. Absolutely exacerbating uh, and, and unwarranted and immoral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, General, Chairman. time has expired. Mr. Chairman, may I just say if there are any witnesses that have any kind of a study on the advertisements paid for by pharmaceutical companies across this country in order of the most, uh, the biggest buys for which drugs and then in rank order, I would love to have that for the record. I, I, I want to say in response to the gentlelady's question, I think that uh, uh, as we begin preparing for uh, uh, the continued work of this committee, uh, that would be a proper subject for a separate hearing. And I want to thank the gentlelady for uh, making that suggestion. Thank you. We're, we are going to go to a second round of questions of the uh, witnesses before we go to our second panel. And, uh, you know, given the fact that we are going to be holding a hearing tomorrow with uh, top insurance executives in this uh, same subcommittee, uh, and the fact that we have two distinguished uh, individuals here who have had uh, direct experience working inside the industry, we're going to uh, hopefully be able to engage a little bit more in the second round. I want to start with uh, uh, Dr. Linda Pino, who is the former review physician for Humana, Incorporated out of Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Pino, uh, the evidence on which evidence-based medicine is supposed to rely is by its nature public, peer-reviewed journals, for example. 
But the detailed standards of care used by private health insurance companies are proprietary, uh, meaning that it's their business and not ours. If the coverage decisions are based on publicly available evidence, why doesn't it follow that the standards these companies use to determine care should also be public? Why aren't they, and what is the reason? Well, the main reason is that their basic purpose is to be able to deny or limit care. So what, what happens, and, and this has been a, a part of the evolution of managed care, is 20 years ago, one of the real uh, difficulties for an insurance company back when I was functioning as a medical director was having you know, some sort of objective grounds to deny something. So for example, if we wanted to deny a hysterectomy, we needed criteria to do that. And that was very labor intensive for a company to develop. So these companies emerged that would actually develop criteria, like we've heard Milliman and Robertson, Dr. Stern referred to them, which is now Milliman USA and other companies that have gotten into the business of developing criteria specifically for healthcare companies to have, it's like a filter, you know, and the tighter the threads of the filter, the more you can limit or, or deny care. So you're saying the, cr the criteria is set up on denying care? Right. I mean, that's, you now, know, I, I, just like I said in my testimony, you don't, you don't purchase criteria in order to provide more care or more generous <laughs> care. You know, the reason these companies spend millions and millions of dollars to buy the criteria to set up the computer system is to enable, as, as requests are made for the more costly or the more frequent and costly services, is for nurses up front or not even nurses sometimes to be able to to say, well, this doesn't, you know, meet our, our criteria, we can't authorize it, we can't so, approve So you say, you know, the standards are proprietary, but are these standards based on evidence or are they just basically uh, accounting devices to try to whittle away the claims? Well, they're, they're loosely based on evidence. I mean, there's, you know, material that's available in research that comes out of academic centers. And so you take this information that is public and has been developed using public funds, and then you tweak it as an accounting, you know, denial tool. Okay, now, now, Dr. Stern, you wanted to get in on this. Uh... The criteria in one case has a focus, that is the, the standard criteria, the standard practice uh, that are publicly available has a sole criteria of cost-effective quality care. That's the criteria. Millman and Robinson is focused on cost reduction. That's the criteria. Okay. And everything that's generated in that criteria is to support the cost reduction. So, so let me a different mission. So let me ask uh, uh, Dr. Pino and Dr. Stern if you want to join in on this. You know, I understand, Dr. Pino, that insurers pay subcontractors to do utilization review as well as handle specific appeals of denials of coverage. Do insurance companies carve out any specific disease for internal special reviews or for outside contractors to review? Oh, yes. And, and that, why, uh, why? that kind of carve out or outsourcing is increasing. Uh, why? I mean, under what circumstances? Well, it began, I mean, one of the earliest carve outs were mental health. Uh, 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 management, you know, where you could carve out the amount of premium that was used for mental health and you subcontract it out to a for-profit mental health management company. You capitate them, so you fix your cost, and then they have to take care of all of the, the medical conditions with, within that. And then that has slowly emerged and grown into now we have disease management companies that, that will manage a single disease like congestive heart failure or asthma or diabetes or other conditions. So you have, other, so you have a whole industry that's set, that's set up around trying to figure out how to uh, lessen the amount of claims. Exactly. So the patient uh, is me, just Let me just ask you. I, I've got a limited time here to just ask one final question. A uh, person signs up with an insurance company. They receive a policyholder's book that describes all the procedures and costs that are supposed to be covered. Does this mean an insured person will then be covered for all the things listed in the book? Yes or no? No. And then is there one standard of medical necessity across the industry? No. It can is even there, differ within the same company and the same plan. Is there any one standard of medical necessity within each company? No. Okay, I, I, my time's expired. I'm going to uh, now go to uh, Mr. Jordan. Go thank, ahead. thank you, Mr. Chairman. L l let me ask uh, Mr. Ginder, now like and Ms. Ackley, um, the, the harassment you went through dealing with the insurance companies, uh, 
Are you in favor of a, a single payer system, government run system, um, the public option that's received so much discussion of late, or do you think that that just replaces one, you know, instead of having the insurance companies give you harassment, you now have the government. Uh, we know from many countries that have this, at least from what I've read, uh, there are waiting lists, there are difficulties, there are rationing of care eventually when you go that. So do you want us to fix what happened in your situation, make the insurance companies do what they said they were going to do when you bought the policy and paid your premiums, did everything right, or are you in favor of like throwing it all out and going to a, to a single payer government run system? And, and, and I mean, you obviously know where I'm coming from. I, I look at this, the most recent example of government starting a big program, and I just talked with a car dealer the other day, still waiting on 75 percent of the dollars that the Cash for Clunkers program is supposed to get to him. So I, mean, I think there's lots of examples where you have bureaucracy that don't, don't meet the customers' and needs and demands in, a, in at least in a timely fashion. So fill me in. Well, I am in support of a public system, but as um, from our experience, things that would have been beneficial um, with the private industry would include uh, federal oversight of that. You know, the appeals process that we went through, supposedly once my dad's appeals went to the reviewing foundation, we were supposed to get a decision within 48 hours. Um, the first appeals process. Was that, a, was that a state review? Or was that through the state insurance commissioner? Or that how, was coming from the insurance company itself, told oh, us that so we, would, okay. we would get a response. Um, the first appeal process, uh, the hospital received the decision six days later, and then my dad received the decision nine days later. On the second appeal process, the insurance commissioner's office received a decision 10 days later, and then my parents received it 13 days later. So, but there was um, nothing to hold them accountable for the, that. Um, some other things we encountered was, uh, you know, the foundation who is reviewing my dad's case is getting paid directly by the insurance company. So I don't know, that seems but a little you, odd in our. <laughs> but Ms. Ackley, your, your short answer is you, you, mm -hmm. you think a single payer government run system, you would be for moving completely to that, that, that type of system? I think there's benefits with a public run system, All but right. I don't me, see me, the yeah. private industry let being me. eliminated. Okay. You don't, I mean, I guess my question is, you don't think we substitute one set of hassles for another if we, if we go that direction? No, I'll go to you, Mr. Uh, thank you for the, the chance to address the question. I think to revert to what you were speaking about earlier, health savings accounts as a sole measure for health care are woefully inadequate. We, I'm, we not saying, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Yeah. I don't believe putting things solely in the hand of government is the solution. I believe that a public option is a necessity to provide a baseline. I think as a member of the Republican Party myself, I think we talk out of both corners of our mouth when we express concerns about government inefficiencies on one hand, not being able to get it done. Yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, we say, but if the government provided a public option, we would undercut, lowball the price in health care and, and run the private sector out. Which is it? It's one way mm -hmm. or the other. It isn't both, unless we're not dealing direct. I think there's a desperate need for regulation so that the consumer, the end consumer, the end user, has recourse. We have none now. The, the way it's set up now, our employers largely negotiate with a limited pool of providers to figure out what choices we have. Then the employee gets to select from that menu, and then we get to sub-select a doctor who's covered under that. Now, I did it backwards. I found good doctors and then went up the chain of command. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate. I work at a huge bureaucracy of 80,000 employees, and the employees pick our contracts. If I had worked at a small mom and pop who was nice enough to give us coverage, I wouldn't have had that luxury. Our, our, we've been audited repeatedly, and we've got some of the most effective policies in this country, thanks to the employee unions who negotiated. That all said, my doctor is handcuffed, because they, do, they determine through their best judgment what the pro proper care is, 
and it's constantly meddled and interfered with by people who are looking at one thing. How can they do this less expensive? I don't believe that in the United States of America, a single-payer government system is what would be best at this point in history. Uh, I do believe that it's incumbent upon all of you to survey the world, just like a business would if you want to continue on the business model. If I want to know how my competition is yeah. beating me, I'm going to go find out what they're doing. I'm going to take their best ideas and make it work within my... Let me ask you this question, because I think your statements, I mean, sort of beg this question. If, in fact, the government's running it, what, what's our recourse then if we don't like what, what, they, what they decide? You're in, you, 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 get, you get hassled. You get, what's our recourse then? I can tell you that the services I do get to the government for my daughter, uh, we've had almost no problem with. And when we do, there is a clearly identified appeal process with a clearly identified timetable with a clearly identified resolution. Nobody is going to be happy all the time. That's just not realistic. Uh, as the proud son of a Dutch mother, I could tell you that the waiting lists that you speak about are not a reality in the Netherlands. And it hurts me as a father and as an American that my relatives have offered to take my daughter and I in because we wouldn't be facing the delays and denials that we are here. As the proud husband of a Belizean American, when we traveled to Belize, a third world Central American country, my daughter got sick on the flight over. We were hospitalized for four days. The bill was $7. $7 in a country where children don't have shoes to go to school. A proud country, a beautiful country. I certainly don't want to take out a context of maligning the country, but clearly a poverty-stricken nation. Four days of hospital care with medication, $7. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, let me just 15 seconds by unanimous consent. Uh, I think the answer to the gentleman's question clearly is what happens if you don't like what government is doing is it's government. You have a vote and you change it. That's where the people get to have a part in it. We don't get that vote with the insurance companies. Then that's the problem. No, we we no. can rant and we can rave and we can do it, but all we get to do is go to another company with the same we bad can, practices if we don't like the first one. I, I appreciate it, gentlemen, but, but we can also change the law and, and make the, you know, we do have a, a say in this as well. We can make the system work better we, and, and do one that doesn't turn it all over to the government as well. That's Congress. I mean, I agree with you. That's we great. can act. If you've got gentlemen for strict regulation, we can all get there pretty soon. Uh, I want to thank uh, both of my colleagues for that exchange. Uh, the great thing about this committee is that we like to hear what each other has to say. Uh, Mr. Cummings, you're recognized. Mr. Mr. Gendernart, is it pronounced right? Yes, sir. Um, I think you're saying what I'm feeling. I just want us to have an effective and efficient system that also has an element of empathy. The President used to talk about, uh, and I guess he still does, uh, a society where we have an empathy deficit. Because we can put all of the, we can put all of the rules and regulations in place, but if we don't have people in, in those places that see people as more than a number or nor, uh, more than a statistic or not worrying about a bonus over the life of a a person, it won't make a lot of difference. But I want to go to, and I, so I agree with you, Mr. Mr. Potter. Um, what is the, I mean, if this puts you in the place in your old position, and somebody walked into your office and said, Potter, we got a problem. Those folks over there in the, uh, in the, uh, on Capitol Hill, they've come up with this thing called a public option. What do we do about that? I mean, and I'm t I mean, in other words, I'm trying to figure out. I want. I hear the insurance companies on one hand say that they're worried about uh, being not a, being able to compete, but on the other hand, saying that they that there are certain things that they have to have in. Or, well, the first thing they don't want is a public option, and I'm just kind of trying to figure out. What are what would be the concerns? What are those concerns? And then I'd like to hear from you, Ms. Pina, also. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the, the and are they legitimate? Well, the insurance industry actually had, has had this concern has been preparing for opposition to the public plan uh, since before Barack Obama was elected president. And I was there during a lot of the meetings in which uh, we reviewed every presidential candidate's platform for uh, for health care reform. And as you probably know, um, President Obama. Um, 
uh, Hillary Clinton, Senator Clinton and uh, Senator Edwards all had the public option as a central component of their 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 their, their, their campaign platforms. So the industry had a long time to develop the strategy to try to oppose that. And then what we're seeing now is it being carried out. And they they've been saying uh, the things that we've been we've been hearing that make no sense that. Um, it will put them out of business because it will be run too efficiently uh, on the one hand or uh, that we should oppose it because it's a government run system. Uh, they, they want to try to make, they want to, de to defame it and uh, make it seem as if this is a government takeover of the health care system. Those are the terms that they use. That's part of the strategy that was developed a long time ago. It's been an evergreen uh, stay, uh, phrase that works for them every time there's an attempt to reform the health care system. What are they afraid of? They're afraid of uh, having something that might uh, take a little bit of revenue from them. If there's no public option and if you have an individual mandate, look what happens. Uh, everybody has to buy their product. And if the person can't afford that product, then you and I and other taxpayers will have to pay the subsidies. And those subsidies, the premium dollars that the people will pay and the tax dollars that subsidize them will flow right into those, those for-profit companies or all those companies for that matter. And then a lot of that will take and be taken away and go into shareholders' pockets. That's what they, they don't want to have another competitor. They've been consolidating for many, many years, taking the small players out, uh, gaining control of markets and market share. So of course they're going to try to oppose anything that would compete with them, but certainly anything that they could, they could operate more efficiently. When I see, and when I see, and when I hear the insurance companies say, uh, we're ready to come to the table, we'll get rid of the pre-existing conditions, we'll get rid of the rescissions and they go through all of that, it, it makes it sound as if they, they're basically admitting that this stuff is wrong. Oh, absolutely. And they, they said exactly the same thing in testimony before Congress in 1993, and I can point you to it. Uh, they know that's wrong. But after, after the, plan fell, the, the Clinton plan fell, did you see them coming here to Congress and ask them to change the laws? No, of course they didn't. They have thrived. They've made tons and tons of million, billions of dollars uh, with the system that we have now. They, they're not sincere. It's just rhetoric. Uh, they would agree to it. if, if they, would, they could thrive in a system in which these things are made illegal, uh, but they know how to make money. It's kind of like squeezing a balloon. Uh, you could make them do certain things. You can regulate them. But what you would have is pressure from Wall Street to figure out ways, unique ways for them to deny care or to shift more of the financial burden to consumers. They'll, Is there any, without a public option, do you see any way where we can control costs? In other words, costs of premiums going In a word, no. In two words, absolutely no. Absolutely. Can I just hear from Ms. Ms. Dr. Pino just, just, just real quick? I saw she was just getting all excited. General Lady may, re may respond uh, briefly <laughs> Thank to you Mr. Very much, Mr. Cummings. Go ahead. Thank you. Please go ahead, Dr. Pino. Well, in your general uh, question about why they would oppose the, the public option is because I think, you know, Mr. Potter referred to them as a cartel, and it's a cartel that works with very secret hidden practices that suddenly would, ha would possibly be disclosed if they had to compete with a real competitor. So all of these methods, these secret hidden methods for profit maximization uh, would become more public. And, um, and, you know, they could come to the table and they could say, oh, well, we will give up pre-existing conditions, we'll give up rescission, but that's only because they have so refined all of the other methods behind the scenes. And I see this in case after case after case where I've worked as an expert witness where, you know, after, uh, you know, uh, all of the labor of finally getting documents that have to be compelled by a judge and we see the inner, inner practices, you know, these systems are so, I mean, they could give up these other things and still have the methods uh, to, to maximize profits. That's why they no longer worry about possibly having uh, all of these other persons who are uninsured. Uh, because they now can control the cost of the people who are going to be costly. You know, that's a, it's a process that's been refined over the past decade in ways that are just unimaginable and would take, you know, days to explain how all these devious methods work. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would say that it would probably be the, to the great benefit of Congress to um, have uh, still another hearing of this subcommittee where we actually would go into great detail about how all these uh, means and ways are used to, uh, uh, to deny coverage. 
Um, the chair recognizes Ms. Kaptur for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Potter, do you have the ability to put on the record the profit margins of the largest insurance companies that you've been referencing? Sure, I can, I can get that data. All right. How would it compare to the profits that are made, let's say, uh, by the supermarket industry, the food industry, or um, uh, the clothing industry? I mean, how would you compare, as your, from your knowledge of the industry? Well, it, 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 the, the profit margin is higher than grocery stores, and, and I, 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 I haven't compared all the other sectors of the economy. Uh, the, the, in fact, I just heard this week that the insurance industry was uh, putting out uh, propaganda saying that uh, only 3 percent of the, rev the premium dollar goes to profits or something like that. Um, it varies widely from company to company and product to product. Uh, some of these products are extraordinarily profitable, and the, the ones that they want us to move us all in to these high deductible plans and consumer directed plans, the profit margins will expand greatly. They can make tons and tons of money on this. So that's what they want to do in the future. That's why the, the, the trend is the way it is. Um, uh, but, but think of it this way. Let's assume just that it is 3 percent, and let's assume that, and, and that's an assumption, it's the truth, that $250 billion of our, the money that we spend on health care flowed through those c seven companies. Uh, last year alone in revenue, uh, three percent of that is a ton of money. It's a lot of money in profit. So uh, they'll they'll use sometimes small numbers to make you think that it's inconsequential, but it's a huge, huge amount of money. Base. Uh, let me go back to my example of Uncle Uncle Skip. How much duplication? How do we get a handle on how much money is being wasted in the system? Because consumers are innocently or fearfully buying numerous plans to cover themselves when they are unneeded. How do we get at that? What is the mechanism to get at that? Uh, I know the yeah. standard benefit plan, that is one of the goals of the legis reform legislation, right. to have a benefit plan that people know they can depend upon. Yeah. But how does one get at that waste inside the system? Well, there's, there's a lot of waste. Uh, McKinsey and Company, which does a lot of consulting work for big insurance companies and, and other uh, large corporations, did a study of health care systems and compared our system with those abroad. And I think uh, the doctor noted that 30 percent of the money we spend here is on administration that is not spent in other countries. And that is not just because uh, you have that much inside the insurance industry, but is caused by the insurance industry. The multi-payer system we have now, uh, there is an enormous amount of administration that goes on within these companies, but it requires doctors and hospitals to hire big staffs just to deal with them. I so that is 30 percent. I and understand the administrative point, about but I, yeah, a third the, of the money. But I am talking about citizens, who millions of them out there in our country, yeah. who are buying policies they don't need yeah. because they are victims in the marketplace, in essence. Yeah. They are fearful of the future. They don't believe that what they have is secure. How, how much money is being wasted on that? You know, I think that would be a, a, good, a good research project. I haven't seen the data myself on that because it is not so easily found. But you would need to, to look at the, the kinds of policies that the, the companies are selling, uh, what benefits they have, and, and whether or not they are really worth a dime. And then you can also look at the policies that are being spent on, on, on fake insurance or uh, that I have talked about. The, the, these big companies are now getting into that. It is not just fly the nice that are doing it. And this is, these are plans that people, it is not just supplemental, it is what is being sold as, as the, the, the choice that they have available to them that is affordable. Keep this in mind. Don't be, don't be uh, blinded by just this talk about uh, affordable premiums because they will sell you. They will market something that has the uh, premiums being affordable, but it, the, the benefits will be so lousy you might as well not be insured. If there are senior citizens listening today, if they have a Medicare policy with a supplemental plan that is recognized by the Department of Health and Human Services, do they need extra catastrophic coverage? I don't think they would. I mean, it, it, the, the, the basic Medicare benefits are, are pretty good. If you have got the, uh, you know, a, a reasonably good supplemental plan, uh, then I can't imagine why you would need to spend, shell out a lot more of your scarce resources for. And where the fault line is, is the public, large numbers in the public don't understand that. Exactly. They and don't. so there are people that play that portion of the market. There are firms that play that portion of the market, and they force product on people um, that is really unnecessary. And 
I can't think of a place. Uh, I know we have a state insurance commissioner in the state of Ohio. You can call that number. But this issue of consumer protection and insurance plan buying is very important, and money is being wasted all over this country by people who are so scared that they're buying what's unnecessary. We really need to look at that arena. It's huge. It is, and, and it brings up a point that I'd like to make. In, in, in the inadequacy of state regulation, they, they do review marketing materials, but they don't have the resources to do an appropriate job. That's why you have stuff like this going on. The, the, the regulator, regulators are well-intentioned, but they just don't have the resources. States are not wealthy enough to provide all the, the resources that is needed to regulate this, this industry that is so bent on uh, um, taking advantage of consumers. I thank you very much. I know, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Uh, I, I want to th uh, thank the gentlelady, and as she has uh, pursued uh, twice in her line of questioning the issue of, of people, particularly seniors, buying policies uh, beyond uh, their basic Medicare that, you know, policies, extra policies which they may not need and which, in fact, may represent uh, kind of a consumer fraud that people are trying to sell these to seniors. Uh, I just want the gentle lady to know that I've just talked to staff and uh, that is something that we are interested in uh, pursuing to the level of a hearing. We would work with the gentle lady and perhaps we could get Uncle Skip here to testify. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you're welcome. And I just want to say, we, we, this is the Ohio Committee now. Uh, we have Mr. Jordan from Ohio, myself from Ohio, and also Ms. Kaptur. So Ohio is very uh, concerned on this. Uh, some of our colleagues may be rejoining us momentarily. I want to thank this panel. Uh, each one of you has made a contribution through your testimony here today. Uh, some of it uh, heart-wrenching and uh, other of the testimony infuriating. <laughs> Um, we will uh, continue with our investigation tomorrow, but I will say that the testimony that, that came here today was very helpful in preparing us for tomorrow as well as to uh, remind the American people that it's, I think it's good to communicate with each other about our experience, it's not theoretical. You know, Mr. Genderalnik has real experience with the system. Ms. Ackley, your family has some real experience with the system. We need to hear those stories not anecdotes, what really happened. So, and as uh, Dr. Stern told his experience as well. So this experience is very important because I think, uh, frankly, whatever kind of system we end up with, the transformation is going to be driven by the power of the narratives, which we hear from across the country. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank each and every one of you and also to salute uh, Mr. Potter and Dr. Pino for your courage in coming forward. and. Uh, giving an insider's point of view that we would rarely get a chance to hear from. Uh, uh, and so you're, I, I, I just want to thank you personally and on behalf of the committee for uh, being here. And we, we look forward to your continued uh, work and cooperation. Uh, the, uh, this panel is now dismissed. We're going to ask the second panel to come forward. As uh, the staff is getting the table ready, I just want to remind everyone that this is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. The topic of today's hearing between you and your doctor, the private health insurance bureaucracy. I'm joined by the uh, ranking member, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Kaptur from Ohio and other members who have been here throughout the uh, hearing. Uh, we uh, want to thank the first panel. We're now going to uh, go to the second panel. We're fortunate to have uh, an outstanding second panel of witnesses. I would like to first introduce Ms. Karen Pollitz. Is that correct? Welcome. Uh, Ms. Pollitz is the project director of the Health Policy Institute at Georgetown University here in Washington where she's also an adjunct professor of Georgetown's Graduate Public Policy School. Professor Pollitz directs research on health insurance reform issues as they affect consumers and patients, focusing on the regulation of private health insurance plans and markets, managed care, consumer protections, and access to affordable health insurance. Ms. Pollitz is a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. She's also a member of the advisory board of the California Health Benefits Review Program and has served on the Board of Directors of the Maryland Health Insurance Plan, as well as the National Committee on Quality Assurance. 
Previously, Professor Pollitt served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health Legislation at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 1993 to 1997, acting as the Secretary's Legislative Liaison on all federal health care issues, including national health care reform, Medicare, Medicaid, and U.S. Public Health Service agencies and programs. Mr. Michael Cannon. Welcome, Mr. Cannon. Mr. Cannon is the Cato Institute's Director of Health Policy Studies. Previously, he served as a domestic policy analyst for the U.S. Senate Republican Policy Committee under Chairman Larry Craig, where he advised the Senate leadership on health, education, labor, welfare, and the Second Amendment. He co-authored a book on, the, on competition in health care. Uh, Mr. Cannon has had his work published in numerous national media publications and has also appeared as a commentator on television and radio. I want to thank you, Ms. Cannon, Ms. Pollitz, for appearing before the subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you, raise, uh, that you rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. I do. Thank you very much. Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, I'm going to, uh, as we did with the first panel, ask each witness to give a summary of his or her testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Uh, keep in mind your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Uh, Professor Pollitt, you'll be our first uh, witness for this panel. Uh, you may proceed. We'll get your testimony in and uh, uh, maybe we'll be able to hear from both of you before we run to votes. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I just want to open by saying I'm also from Ohio. I grew up um, in the Cleveland area when you were mayor, Mr. Chairman, so it's very nice to be here today. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank you for holding this very important hearing. I hope and expect that health care reform, when it is enacted, will create rules to prohibit or at least limit um, a lot of the practices that you heard about this morning on the first panel. But rules will not be enough. There will always be a strong incentive in a competitive insurance market for insurance companies to try to avoid risks, avoid enrolling them, keeping them enrolled, or avoid paying their claims. And so transparency and accountability in insurance is essential, and it's very important that health reform try to accomplish that as well. Transparency and insurance will involve a number of key changes, and most important of these will be data reporting. When I was invited to testify at this hearing, I was asked, could I provide data on how often practices like these happen? And the answer was, I cannot. And neither can uh, regulators or other policy makers, but these, the information is knowable. Um, regulators need to have ongoing detailed information about marketing and enrollment practices and and about how coverage, is it, how coverage is administered so that it will be possible to see when insurers are avoiding risk that they are supposed to cover. We don't do that today. The federal government collects no data on health insurance consumer protections, even though federal law requires certain important protections already, including guaranteed renewability of coverage. For the most part, states don't collect a lot of data on consumer protection in health insurance either. Instead, most data collected on an ongoing basis by state insurance departments relates to financial solvency. And regulators rely largely on consumer complaints as an indicator of problems. However, a body of research shows that rarely do consumers lodge formal complaints with um, regulators, even about serious health insurance problems that cost them a lot of money or that delay their access to care. A series of hearings about health insurance rescissions that were initiated in this committee provides a sobering, sobering case study of how little we know about how well health insurance works for consumers and how vulnerable they are to discrimination. This committee asked all 50 state regulators what data they collect on health insurance rescissions, and in response, only four states could provide any data on the number of rescissions that had occurred. Only 10 could provide the number of individual insurance policies that were in force in their state, and more than a third of states could not supply a complete list of companies that sell individual health insurance within their borders. The NAIC polled all 50 state insurance departments and provided summary complaints data about health insurance rescissions. They found a total of 181 complaints about health insurance rescissions had been lodged over a 
excuse me, a five-year period. By contrast, when this committee asked just three insurance companies how many policies they had rescinded over the same period, the answer was almost 20,000. A new approach to health insurance regulation must require ongoing and detailed reporting by insurers of data that will enable regulators to evaluate how the market works, especially for the sickest consumers. That would include data on enrollment, retention, disenrollment, on rating practices at issue and at renewal. Regulators must also track measures of coverage effectiveness to see what medical bills are paid and how many are left for consumers to pay on their own. That means insurers also need to report data on provider participation, fees, insurer reimbursement levels, health insurance policy loss ratios, and data regarding claims payment and utilization review practices. If regulators have access to this kind of information, patterns of problems that affect the sickest consumers won't be as easy to hide. Finally, Mr. Chairman, health insurance must also be held accountable for compliance with market rules and consumer protections. As Ms. Kaptur talked about um, her uncle buying additional policies, that's illegal. Um, so it's not enough to have rules. Um, we have to enforce the rules. And that requires resources for oversight and enforcement. In addition, it's time for the federal government to take a more proactive role in health insurance regulation. Current federal capacity for private health insurance oversight and regulation is practically non-existent. Last year, a witness from CMS testified that that agency dedicated only four part-time staff to HIPAA private health insurance matters for the entire nation. Further, despite press reports alleging abusive rescission practices in violation of federal law, the agency did not investigate or even make inquiries as to whether federal guaranteed renewability protections were being adequately enforced. This outcome is not surprising. When you enacted HIPAA in 1996, Congress created important federal rights for consumers but limited federal enforcement authority. Instead, Congress opted to rely primarily on state enforcement by adopting a so-called federal fallback enforcement structure. Federal enforcement is triggered only as a last resort once a finding is made that states have not adopted and substantially enforced federal minimum standards. Um, under this structure, it's not surprising that the federal government lacks oversight and enforcement capacity. It doesn't make sense to build and maintain capacity that you don't expect to use. Um, so you rely on the states instead, but unfortunately, limited regulatory capacity is a problem at the state level as well. Um, insurance department staff have been cut um, and states are overworked. It's time for the federal government to assume an active and effective role in enforcement of federal health insurance standards and to require transparency so that we can see how coverage works. Thank I you. thank the gentlelady, Mr. Cannon. You may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to uh, share with you my thoughts about providing secure health insurance to uh, American consumers. How do we ensure that insurance plans honor their commitments to care for the sick? It's a problem whether we're talking about private insurance plans or government plans. Private plans, whether through indifference or incompetence, do sometimes shirk on those commitments. So does government. In 2007, a 12-year-old Maryland boy named Diamante Driver died because his mother could not access the care that Diamante was supposedly guaranteed under a government health plan. As former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle acknowledges, even if we achieve universal coverage, some percentage of patients will fall through the cracks. Healthcare is a human endeavor. That means perfection is not an option. Our, our task is to find the set of rules that least often leaves Americans in the position of Diamante Driver and his family. In my written testimony, I cite a growing body of economic literature that finds that lightly regulated insurance markets perform actually much better than critics suggest, providing secure coverage to millions of Americans with high cost illnesses. And I also express my concerns with the reform measures that Congress is considering. For example, legislation before the House would compel tens of millions of Americans to purchase private health insurance and would shower private insurance companies with billions of dollars in taxpayer subsidies. And not, I would add, because insurance companies are doing a fantastic job. Another provision of the legislation would impose price controls on private health insurance premiums. As President Obama's economic advisor Larry Summers has said, quote, price controls inevitably create harmful economic distortions. An, an example of one of those distortions, if you think insurers try to avoid the sick now, wait until government price controls force insurers to sell a $50,000 policy for, ju for just $10,000. It is worth noting that the insurance lobby supports both the proposal to make health insurance compulsory and the proposed price controls because they would subsidize and protect private insurance companies from competition. 
Whether we support a new government health program or oppose it, I think we should all be able to agree that we don't need to further subsidize and protect private insurance companies from competition. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Cannon and Ms. Pollitz for their testimony. Uh, we, we have votes that are on right now, and I just would like to um, invite you to do one of two things, and this is up to you. Uh, you can either respond to written questions from members of this uh, subcommittee, and they will be included in the record, or you can come back uh, probably in about, about 45 minutes uh, at the conclusion of the votes, and then we can go to a second round of, of questionings uh, uh, at, at the panel here. So what would, you, what would you prefer? I would be happy to come back in 45 minutes. To do that, okay. Okay, my, my colleague suggests it might be uh, uh, let's say a half hour. Okay. So so let's let's say let's come back in a half hour then, and we'll go to questions. And I thank you for your patience. We're going to go vote right now. Thank you. The uh, committee is in recess uh, for the vote. We'll be back in a half hour. Committee will come to order. I'd like to uh, thank the witnesses for remaining, and I'd, I'd like to uh, begin asking uh, by asking Mr. Cannon. Uh, under what circumstances do you see that um, um, that making private health insurance compulsory represents a bailout to the insurance industry. How do you, could you explain that view? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and hold the mic a little bit close, okay. Certainly. Mr. Chairman, in order to help Americans comply with what they call the individual mandate in the legislation before the House, and the, there's one in the legislation before the Senate as well, Congress, uh, has decided it would, ha or the legislation would offer subsidies to Americans to help them purchase health insurance. Simply mandating that people purchase health insurance doesn't mean that they'll be able to. Uh, a lot of people won't be able to, inf to afford it. Uh, and so Congress would be, in this legislation, offering subsidies to a lot of people who ca cannot afford health insurance on their own and to a lot of people who can afford health insurance on their own because the subsidies, as I understand them, would go up to um, 300 or 400 percent of the federal poverty level, which for a family of four is somewhere around sixty, eighty thousand dollars uh, per year. Um, those subsidies offered to people who can afford health insurance already and to people who cannot uh, would, would uh, essentially help people purchase more health insurance and, uh, and, and uh, ex give the insurance industry really a guaranteed customer base uh, and a guaranteed source of revenue. Uh, so I think that uh, essentially what, the, what that legislation would do was, uh, is, is um, akin to uh, a bailout of, of the health insurance industry. I don't think that what we should be doing is, is giving more uh, to, this, uh, to this sector or, the, or, or to this industry. I think we should be demanding more from it. And I think the way to do that is, is to preserve the freedom to choose uh, whether or not to purchase health insurance as well as the freedom to choose what goes into your health insurance policy. And the way to do that, in my view, is to let consumers control the money that government and employers now control to purchase health insurance on their behalf. And they will, uh, they will economize on, on health insurance. They will, um, they will purchase, uh, most likely purchase less health insurance than they do right now. Um, and they will hold health insurers accountable uh, in a way that they cannot when their employers are making those decisions for them. So let's, uh, let's go f four years down the road. Let's say that a health care plan is enacted which requires that people uh, have uh, private insurance. Let's say there's no public option. That's kind of the way it looks like right now. And um, people, there will be tens of millions of Americans who will be faced with a decision to either purchase the private insurance or pay a fine. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, would you like to comment on that? I think that uh, what that really highlights is that this uh, proposal for uh, to mandate people purchase health insurance, this proposal for, to make health insurance compulsory in the United States amounts to a tax on a lot of uh, middle class families. If they uh, purchase the health insurance, as uh, President Obama's economic advisor Larry Summers acknowledges, when the government forces people to purchase something that they don't value or pay more than the market would demand, that is in itself a tax. But if they don't purchase uh, the mandatory level of coverage and they have to pay what uh, we euphemistically call a fine or a penalty, that is, that's, that's a tax as well. And in the House legislation, there would be a tax on the individual equal to 2.5 percent of, of income, of adjusted gross income. And if the individual's employer does not offer them coverage, there would be a tax equal to 8 percent of payroll. Now, uh, Mr. Summers and the Congressional Budget Office and uh, economists broadly acknowledge that that 8 percent uh, payroll tax would be paid for by the worker because it would reduce her earnings. So what you're talking about there is a 10.5 percent uh, tax is that, is on that, the uninsured. Is that axiomatic? It is. So you're saying that if workers have a health care benefit, uh, they're in effect paying for it? Absolutely. And I, I think, in fact, that is why, uh, that, I think that's the great, uh, uh, the biggest drawback or the biggest problem with the tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance. The quote-unquote employer contribution to the average family plan in this country uh, amounts to $10,000. That's $10,000 of the worker's earnings that the worker doesn't get to control. The government, by creating this tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance, essentially ta takes that $10,000 out of the worker's hands gives it to the employer and lets the employer make the worker's uh, health insurance de decisions for the worker. So, so yes, I think that uh, economists, in fact, there was a survey of, of health economists recently, and the uh, broadest area of agreement was on the question of whether uh, health benefits actually come out of uh, wages or, or, or profits or something else. They, uh, Ninety percent of economists, health economists acknowledged or agreed with the proposition that, yes, workers pay for those health benefits through reduced wages, as Thank well you. as, and the same is true of any tax penalties that Congress might impose. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Uh, Professor Pollitz, uh, I, I want to speak to you about how government can help the public make better choices about health insurance. In, in uh, your testimony, you pointed out something that many people may not realize, and I quote, the primary purpose of health insurance data collected by state regulators today is to monitor the solvency of private health insurers and that, quote, enforcement of consumer protections in health insurance today is largely triggered by complaints. Uh, I think the average person is or would be surprised to hear this. So who does monitor things like accessibility, affordability, or security of private health insurers? or how accurately or fully they pay out on claims? Um, it's not, it is not well monitored or consistently monitored today. I think state insurance regulators strive mightily to protect consumers as best they can. Their resources are limited. Would you describe the state regulators as reactive to consumer complaints rather than proactive? Um, a lot of it is reactive, oftentimes in response to a complaint. Um, even as, as little as one complaint, a state regulator may uh, initiate a broader investigation of a company or of a pattern of practices. So I don't mean to suggest that state regulators aren't out there giving it their best effort, but um, they are uh, very strapped in terms of resources. They are very uh, broad in terms of the jurisdiction that they need to keep an eye on. And with limited resources, I mean, if I were one and I had the limited resources, I would probably start with solvency myself because if a company goes under, then no claims will be paid for anybody. So that's not an illogical place to start, but there are not enough resources to monitor closely what needs to be monitored. And with health insurance, that's a very transaction heavy um, uh, task to, to accomplish. Do, uh, do private health insurers themselves keep data on complaints made against them uh, that can be reviewed? That can be reviewed? Yeah. Uh, huh. um, I don't actually know what data they would keep. All insurance companies have a compliance office with a lot of attorneys, and I'm sure they at 
at least have a pretty good idea um, of what complaints are being filed. And they have to keep records. I mean, this is why you get urged to put everything in writing when you're, uh, course, but when you're communicating with your insurance company so that there will be a record somewhere. Okay, my, my time's expired. I'm going to go to my colleague for five minutes, and then we'll go uh, to one more and fin uh, one uh, final round of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cannon and, and Ms. Poltz, thank you for, for being here. Uh, Mr. Cannon, let, let me ask you about uh, this idea of interstate uh, insurance, broadening the, the field, increasing the market, increasing competition. In, in the first panel, the, there were, I believe Dr. Pino and Mr. Potter talked about the cartel that exists in the insurance market right now. Uh, their solution was to have the government compete. That's, you know, the, increase competition by having this so-called public option. The, the approach I prefer is this interstate um, market. Uh, tell me your thoughts on that, uh, what the research shows. It's getting, this, this is, you know, now being debated a lot and talked about as a possible improvement. Um, let, let, me, let, let me hear your, your thoughts there. Well, I think that uh, the insurance markets in most states are not unlike a cartel. And I think the reason is that is because each state um, sets up barriers to competition uh, to protect their domestic insurers. What, th what those are are essentially state licensing laws. Now, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with uh, uh, a state licensing law per se, but what these laws do is they say unless your uh, insurance policy is licensed by this state, say the Commonwealth of Virginia, then you may not sell it to residents of this state. And so what that means is that residents of Virginia cannot purchase a health insurance policy that's available in Maryland or in right. North Carolina. Uh, that's particularly cruel, I think, to residents of, say, uh, New Jersey, who face some of the highest health insurance premiums in the country. Uh, they cannot purchase health insurance from uh, across the Delaware River in Pennsylvania, where it's often less expensive. Uh, so what happens, so, so I do think there is insufficient competition in insurance markets. The President uh, and, and other supporters of a, of a new government program have said that they can, that, that a new competitor can keep insurance companies honest. If that's the case, then I think that dozens of new competitors would do an even better job. Right. So that if Congress, using its power under the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution, were to say, look, you know, states can license health insurance, but they cannot prohibit their residents from purchasing health insurance licensed by another state. What that would do is it would uh, bring new entrants into the, the markets in each state, give individuals and empl employers a lot more choices uh, of health insurance plans and, and increase competition. What it would also do it was, is it would give individuals and employers the power to avoid unwanted, costly state regulations. Uh, a lot of state regulations are, in fact, consumer protections, solvency standards that uh, Ms. Pollitz was talking about are, are, I think, a prime example. But when you start uh, looking at how the states require consumers to purchase 40 different types of mandated benefits that they right. may not want or need, or try to impose hidden taxes on the healthy right. uh, in order to subsidize That's the sick. That's where savings can take place, sure. Those, those are, uh, increase, those are uh, uh, regulations that increase the cost of insurance and make it unaffordable for some people. So you can't really call them consumer protections if they're keeping people from purchasing health insurance. And I think that letting people purchase insurance across state lines would allow people to. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. The proposals to allow sale across state lines that have been in the Congress to date um, are really a prescription for insurance fraud. There would be um, little practical ability of the licensing state to regulate insurance sold across the 50 states. Imagine if the Ohio commissioner had to keep track of policies that were sold in California and Texas and mm -hmm. New York. They're not set up for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the notion of escaping uh, mandated benefits is a total red herring. The reason that health insurance costs more in New Jersey compared to Maryland, where I live, um, which has been cited as the champion of mandated benefits, supposedly we have more in Maryland than anywhere, um, is that in New Jersey, uh, everybody has to be offered health insurance. You can't be turned down because you have cancer. And in Maryland, you can. So it's cheaper. And insurance Mr. will Cannon always... Mr. talked a lot the, about that in his last and in the, the previous question. I, I think we have to come back to what is the basis of competition in health insurance mm -hmm. right now. And it is competition to avoid sick people and their costs. And the more you dilute um, oversight and regulation, the more easy that will be and the more consumers get, will be at risk. A, a response from Mr. Cannon. Um, uh, uh, 
Karen raises a couple of important issues. Uh, one of them is how do you enforce these rules uh, that are written by an out-of-state um, um, legislature or, or insurance right. commissioner? And I think there's a fairly straightforward way of doing that. You have those regulations, whatever they may be, incorporated in the insurance contract, which could then be enforced in the purchaser's home state and in their courts. So. Uh, and, and then, and then the domestic, uh, the, the the purchaser's insurance commissioner could even play a role there. What's important is, is that the individual consumer uh, or the employer be able to choose the rules, and uh, they could be uh, enforced at home without having to rely on an out-of-state insurance commissioner. As for uh, the cost of mandated benefits, the, the cost estimates vary, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts recently estimated that the uh, benefits that are mandated in that state add 12. Uh, percent to the cost of premium. So that's right. a substantial chunk of money. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it looks like just you and me. I yield back to you. Just you and me. I, this town is big enough for both of us. Um, I'd like to go back to Ms. Pollitz. I'd like to talk to you about standards of care and, uh, and a possible scenario. Are, are you aware of any data on the is inconsistent application of standards of care by private insurers. Is it possible that within two, uh, uh, taking two different people with the same illness who are insured by the same private health insurer, that they'll be treated differently by the insurance company? Is that possible? I believe it's possible, yes. And so is there any guarantee that if a person buys coverage, it will guarantee coverage? Um, not an ironclad guarantee, no. Pardon? Not an ironclad guarantee, no. There is a contract, but it, it, it's very hard. But there's no guarantees. That's saying. correct. Uh, I'd like to ask you about lack of transparency in private health insurance uh, as compared to Medicare. Uh, Congress and the general public are able to examine and debate the reasoning behind how Medicare pays for medical care, but the private health insurers keep their decision-making process and guidelines hidden behind uh, thick books of confusing terminology. In other words, Medicare's actions are transparent, but private insurers are not. Uh, but they provide the same service, ostensibly, to cover medical expenses. Now, is there any justification to keeping insurance company definitions of medical necessity proprietary? I don't think so, no. And why would the insurance company want to keep that information pr pr proprietary? I believe they'll argue so that uh, doctors and other providers don't try to game the system and sort of code their billing so that you know it, it matches up what the um, you know what the guidelines would be. But um, um, I think you heard testimony on the earlier panel that there is also an effort to just you know kind of try to hide the ball and try to you know create options for the insurance company to deny claims if they feel like they want to do that. Uh, are there, uh, are there any data nationally about either the frequency of wrongful denials of claims or of unjustified reviews or appeals? Um, there are not good consistent data. Um, I tried a couple of years ago to study the results of even external appeals programs and the data are very sparse. Um, what you can find is uh, suggests that we need to be doing a better job um, and looking much more carefully and not relying on this sort of end result of a patient having to go through all of the um, all of the steps and appeals um, uh, you know before they can get to a system where records will be kept um, anything else you wanted to add about that uh, uh, that you haven't told this committee about the uh, data collection um, I, I really do think, Mr. Chairman, that we need to think carefully about the ways that insurance companies compete now to avoid paying claims. Um, uh, certainly there are reasons why you know, we don't want to pay for care that's not medically necessary. We don't want to pay for fraud. I mean, there, we, there are reasons for vigilance for sure. Um, but I think we need to think from the patient's perspective about what we need to track. Um, so that we can make sure that decisions are justified, that they're backed up, that they're consistent, and that they're in the patient's best interests, and then build our data reporting requirements from that exercise. I think we need a much more proactive and pro-patient approach to 
data gathering from health insurance companies, and I hope that will be a central part of any health reform legislation that gets enacted. Um, I would, I'd like to ask a, um, a, a question of Mr. Cannon. Uh, you're here representing the Cato Institute, and uh, I've always found very handy this uh, Constitution of the United States, which comes from the Cato Institute, including its, um, its introduction. Uh, I, under our Constitution, you know, the General Welfare Clause, which there's been a lot of discussion about, uh, there, there are some of us who believe that both the preamble to the Constitution and Article I, Section 8 in describing the general welfare, uh, that as we evolve as a nation and have specified health care, retirement security as part of the general welfare, that uh, an, a logical extension of that would be to have health care uh, for all, guided by the principle of uh, enunciated in the Constitution, both in Article I, Section 8 and the preamble. Uh, what, you know, tell me what you, how you see that. The, the question is about the general welfare uh, clause mm -hmm. of the Constitution. Uh, there is a difference of opinion uh, uh, among legal scholars about what that means. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but let me give you my, my best take on, on, what that, uh, on what that disagreement is. Uh, there are some that read that uh, as an expansive grant of power that would, say, give Congress the power to the constitutional authority to uh, enact, say, a single payer system or uh, may, make health insurance compulsory for all Americans. I think that uh, the perspective of uh, Cato's constitutional scholars is that uh, if that were true, if the, uh, uh, if the framers of the Constitution meant for the general welfare clause to be such, such a sweeping, broad, comprehensive grant of power from the states to the federal government, then the rest of the Constitution would, you know, would, would be superfluous. They wouldn't have had to enumerate all the other powers in the Constitution because the general welfare, welfare clause would have taken care of everything. So the very structure of the Constitution itself, I think, argues against a broad uh, or the sort of expansive interpretation of the general welfare clause that you suggest. Well, one of the things that um, uh, that I've always been impressed with is the preamble which Cato provides to the uh, uh, Declaration and the Constitution. And, and one of the things they say in there, uh, my, my colleague, is that uh, it's, not, it's not political will but moral reasoning which is the, uh, the foundation of the political system. And the the, some of the issues that are being brought to us about conditions relating to health care in America are laden with, with moral consequences and moral overtones. And there's like an underlying reality of whether health care, if health care is a privilege based on ability to pay, or is health care a fundamental right in a democratic society, there's like this arc where you go from. Um, uh, from economics, which can be amoral, to um, the imperatives of a democracy that relate directly to morality. And, and I just, I, you know, I th that's, a, that's in, in a way, that's part of the backdrop of this national discussion we're having right now. Is it a, is it a right or is it a privilege? Um, you know, and this, this is part of our unfolding democracy here, trying to dissolve those, try, trying to decipher the, what the meaning of this document is, and also doing it within the context of what our present day needs are and what the, and, and what the very human conditions we find ourselves in and the underlying morality of, you know, is it, is it immoral for somebody to be denied care even when they're paying for policy? You know, these are questions that we have to deal with here. I appreciate uh, having the chance to share that with you. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Jordan, you can, you can uh, conclude this hearing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just go to the, to the premise. Many of the witnesses in the first panel, the, the premise was the government can do it better. Um, you know, we, we know that there's been problems with the way insurance companies deal with, with patients and, and sometimes some of the things that take place. But this idea that, that, that government can do it better, I'd, I'd, I'd like your thoughts on that. In light of Congressional Research uh, Service said that over a billion claims are submitted uh, each year 
uh, to Medicare, 10 <clears> percent <throat> of those claims are denied. Attorney General Holder, I have a quote here, said, by all accounts, every year we lose tens of billions of dollars in Medicare and Medicaid funds to fraud. So your, your thoughts on if, you know, we met with health care professionals. We did uh, health care roundtables in our district uh, over the recess. And, um, you know, we had so many people tell us that, you know, government's already 50 percent of the health care market right now and that um, providers don't get compensated fully for the care they provide when they, when they uh, treat folks in our Medicare and Medicaid system, and therefore the, the folks who are in the private insurance have to pay more to cause just, just the way the system is set up right now. So I'd like both your thoughts. I'll start with Mr. Cannon uh, uh, on this, this premise that has is, is been so um, kind of underlies the, the entire hearing today on somehow that the government can do it better, because as, as you can gather, I have real reservations about that. Well, I, I think, Congressman, that uh, the state of America's health care sector right now is pretty good evidence that the government does not, not do a very good job of managing health care. And I'll give you a couple of examples. You brought up uh, the Medicare program. Um, it, that program uh, has, uh, it has been estimated that uh, one-third of Medicare spending to, does absolutely nothing to improve the health or, uh, uh, or improve, improve the health of patients or improves patient satisfaction, P provides no value to them whatsoever. Um, the, uh, it's often cited that we have, so that's an enormous amount of waste, uh, much even larger than the estimates of fraud in the Medicare program. Uh, it has been estimated that as many as 100,000 Americans die every year due to medical errors in hospitals. Mm -hmm. I submit that Medicare is probably the biggest reason for that because Medicare's payment system actually penalizes doctors and hospitals when they succeed in reducing medical errors. It makes it a losing business proposition. Um, rather than have competition between different payment systems that bring out different dimensions of, uh, that, that, that uh, would improve all dimensions of quality, uh, Medicare gives us uh, uh, good marks on some dimensions of quality, but absolutely horrible marks on, on other mm -hmm. dimensions. One of the uh, biggest problems that the President talks about uh, is uh, the problem of pre-existing conditions, people with high cost illnesses right. uh, who uh, lose their coverage and, and then cannot afford the, the premiums that uh, they're charged on the individual market. That is a problem that has been fueled by government for 60 years. And the reason is that uh, 60 years ago, the government created a tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance coverage that has given us the employer-based system that we have right now that is so cruel, and to use the chairman's words, immoral, that it takes insurance away from people at the moment they need it most, when they lose their jobs, they lose their incomes. And if those people are sick, then they've got a pre-existing condition. That issue, They're not going to be able to get coverage. And if I may finish, okay. well, one, of the, one, of the, one of the studies that I cite in my written testimony uh, finds, uh, looks at, looks at the empirical uh, looks at the data and, and finds that people who purchase insurance directly from an insurance company, people with high cost illnesses who do so, are uh, half as likely to end up uninsured as people who purchase health uh, high cost uh, uh, patients who purchase health insurance from a small employer. Yeah, one of the things we should do it's in, in the legislation I've co-sponsored is to for the family that has to go out and buy it on their own in the market, they should get the same tax advantage that we give to employers who provide it to their employees. And, and that problem has been in place for 60 yeah. years and now. That's and, number and the government my, has my, my yet number to one thing it. we have to do, or one one of the key things we have to do. Ms. Pollitt, you got to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no problem. I think the um, I I think the real different two real differences. Um, one is about accountability. And there is a different level of accountability for government than there is for the private sector. There just is. I think we should try to um, enhance and, and strengthen accountability in the private sector with much stronger oversight and regulation and enforcement, regardless of how you end up structuring health reform. I think that's essential. Um, but the government programs will always be accountable in a different way um, to directly to the voters. They'll always be open in a different way compared to commercial plans. That's well, the way it, we've well, set up our government. I, mean, I think you get an argument from Mr. Cannon and, and, and many of us that, you, you know, a, a real marketplace, they're accountable directly to the consumer. Well, but that's so that's need, my second judgment, point. That's where we need to be headed is to a true marketplace. And that's healthcare. my second point. A marketplace of competing insurance companies will always, always in health insurance compete to avoid sick people. That is the overpowering incentive. It beats everything and it always will. Even in a more regulated marketplace, even in a more transparent place, you're always going to be trying to catch up with that. Introducing a public component to that it's 
it's a it's kind of a funny notion. It's not like the government is going to compete to make more profits than Blue Cross um, or, or WellPoint. Um, it's that um, the no, government if, if, will be there offering a choice that isn't well, we, we motivated need to be clear by on this that. Point. If there's a public option, eventually the public option will dominate. I mean, it, even. Will even, not be, Congressman, did you say? even Congressman Frank has said that a public option will lead to a single payer okay. system. That, I mean, that's this idea that somehow it's not going to do that. I just I don't think flies. I think most Americans have already figured that out, and that's why they're concerned about this. But plan. Mr. Jordan, I was on the board for several years of a public program in my state where I live, our state high risk pool, mm -hmm. and it was administered by a private insurance company. And so you know they and they know how to administer claims, and that is definitely its own art and its own skill. Um, and as the consumer rep on the board, I would ask questions. Um, why do we have so many denials of preauthorization, for example, for mental health services? That turned out to be one of the biggest services that any of our patients used, um, even though that wasn't the major diagnosis. It's very stressful to be sick. People need help. And one of our leading sources of complaints had to do with denials for mental health services. And so I said, why is that? Why are we denying all this care? Well, it turned out it was paperwork. People were supposed to jump through all these hoops and get preauthorization. They had to do it within a certain number of days. And um, it, it was just a, a load of, of, of hoops that they had to jump through. And I said, well, OK, once they go through all these hoops, how many of them were actually denied? And we had thousands of denials. And they said seven. And I said, really? Then why are we doing this? Why are we making them jump through all these hoops? Oh, they said, this is saving you a lot of money. I said. I don't want you to save us a lot of money. We're here to pay for care. We're a high risk pool. They're sick. No one else will take care of them. This is our job. This is what the taxpayers have given us tax dollars to do. Let's stop doing that. We did that. I can't imagine that would happen in the company that Ms. Pino used to, Dr. Pino used to work for. That it's just a different incentive. It competes on a different way. And I think we need to create a different standard for covering health care. And if private insurance companies can't compete against that and survive, well, so what? I mean, we took care of the patients who were sick. And isn't that what this has to be about? Primarily, it, it seems to me that has to be where we start the discussion. Uh, we thank the uh, gentlelady. I want to thank Mr. Jordan for his participation in this hearing and uh, thank uh, both of the witnesses from the second panel for their participation. Uh, as my uh, friend is uh, leaving the room, I, I just wanted to comment, and staff can re relate this to him, that um, uh, some, there are some cases, I suppose, where a public option may lead to a single-payer system at some point. Um, I mean, I actually am the co-author of a bill to create a single-payer system, and I'd like to see a single-payer system. We have 85 members of the House who have signed on to a bill, H.R. 676, a bill I drafted with Mr. Conyers. But that, uh, th that bill, uh, in its uh, fullness, is not likely to have hearings. Uh, and. Uh, While well, there might be a vote on it, uh, it needs a movement behind it that doesn't, uh, that, that needs a little more strength. So while some public options may lead to single payer, uh, I would just like to offer the opinion that it's unlikely that the, that the current status of the public option that is uh, suggested in H.R. 3200 would lead to single payer. The CBO has said in one of its studies that 9 million people uh, at, at most would be covered by, uh, uh, by any kind of a public option. Uh, that uh, the first iteration of that plan was to have 129 million people covered by it. So if you have 9 million people, uh, uh, that particular plan may not pose uh, much of a risk or, actually, frankly, a competitive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, private insurers. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention that since we're talking about public options. You are much appreciated for the time that you've spent, for your patience, and uh, this committee uh, stands adjourned. I want to remind people that tomorrow we will hear from executives from six of the major health insurance companies so that we can uh, follow up and ask them some of the questions that were raised in today's hearing. We all um, are very appreciative of your presence. Uh, committee stands adjourned.
talk to people. Talk to the crowd in person. Yeah, now look. There's. Uh, Next month, take a rare visit inside the Supreme Court as we talk to the justices about the role, traditions, and history of the court.